Am put of intro so, let's start part 10. Chapter 20. The True Potential of a Fallen Angel. So, let's get started. Issei quickly got flustered, seeing how Penemu was pointing her sword at him. Wait a minute, how much damage would I have to do to pass? Oh how do you measure damage? Issei gestured with his hands as fast as possible, though the fall didn't seem to be listening to him. The chestnut couldn't help but grit his teeth when Penemu disappeared from his sight, feeling a great wind behind him. Penemu appeared behind him with amazing speed. Focus, she ordered, directing a strong thrust towards the brunette's chest, making it clear that she didn't mind hurting him seriously. Just before the sword made contact with Issei's skin, a great crimson glow surrounded the entire sight. It could be seen how the figure of the brown-haired man turned around on himself at an incredible speed, kicking him in the chin that sent him flying. Penemu spun in the air, landing on her feet. A small line of destruction spawned behind her trail, indicating that the attack had been stronger than it first appeared. Penemu raised her gaze, fixing it on Issei at the same time that she narrowed her eyes. This child, she couldn't help but think, seeing how armor protected him. The chestnut dematerialized his helmet, flashing a small smile as he opted for a battle stance with one hand forward. Penemu straightened up slowly, unable to take her gaze off him. The wind ruffled Issei's hair very gracefully. I won't make it that easy for you, he declared the brunette, unable to help but smile at her a little more. Penemu raised her sword at his words, then leapt high over him. Issei was barely able to follow her, but still he had time to react. Penemu landed behind him, drawing her sword with all her might to cut him in half. The woman couldn't help but widen her eyes a little when she saw how Issei stopped the attack dead with her two hands, taking the sword from both sides. A great blizzard was generated in the place, at the same time that Issei turned her face to look at her, without that smile disappearing from her face. Penemu's stoic face finally curved into a small smile. Impressive, kid. You can call me Issei. She declared the chestnut with a smile. Her smile quickly disappeared, using both of her hands to break Penemu's sword stance, causing her to fall to her knees on the ground. Issei didn't waste a second, giving him a strong downward kick over his shoulder, creating a crater at his feet. The brown-haired man didn't stop for a second, trying to give him other kicks and punches that Penemu dodged and blocked everyone with his sword. On the last kick, the fall was blocked by her sword, using the momentum of the blow to send her back. The brunette watched with great seriousness as Penemu spun through the air, landing again on her feet with great grace. Issei. Penemu said the brunette's name, closing her eyes deeply as she rubbed her bruised shoulder a little. Very good, the woman declared, fixing her gaze on the chestnut. You can call me Penemu. Issei fixed his gaze intently on the woman's bruised shoulder. I'm sure I hit him with all my might, but I didn't even do him a bit of damage, she thought to the brunette very seriously. Even so, Issei was not intimidated by what he witnessed, and he quickly attacked her with a low kick, trying to do a sweep. Penemu jumped slightly and dodged the attack very easily. Hoping not to give her a chance to counterattack, Issei quickly followed her with a jump, trying to land another kick. Issei couldn't help but widen her eyes when Penemu twisted her back backwards, creating a perfect angle for Issei's foot to embed inside her, barely brushing her abdomen. They both landed on the ground again, and despite what he had witnessed, Issei did not want to be impressed by the woman, so he jumped a little, trying to give her a strong kick to the head, which Penemu dodged, twisting her face back, just barely, receiving a small brush on his chin. What are those moves? She couldn't help but think about the chestnut, gritting her teeth a little at what she witnessed. In any case, Issei's attack hadn't finished, since when he finished doing a 360-degree turn in the air due to the inertia of his attack, he quickly tried to give it a downward kick exactly the same as the previous one. Although this time, Penemu dodged it with great ease, giving a small jump back. Issei's foot sank deep into the earth, kicking up massive debris in place. Issei couldn't help but look at her with great impression at her movements so agile and calculating. The same attack doesn't work twice on me, Penemu declared, looking at him with his typical stoic expression. Issei could only grit his teeth at her words. He quickly wanted to lash out at her with a strong punch. Right at that moment, Issei felt that everything was going slower, since he could witness how Penemu positioned her sword with great precision behind his arm, 
at the same time that he took a small step back to stand aside. Penemu managed to deflect the attack with her sword, demonstrating incredible precision, and then kicked Issei in the legs, causing him to fall on all fours. Penemu raised her sword as high as possible, fixing her gaze intently on the chestnut. It's over. Issei couldn't help but widen his eyes in horror at those words. Penemu turned her katana around to hit him with the blunt side, intending to knock him unconscious. The sword began to descend at enormous speed, making it impossible for Issei to respond in time. Wait. Diedrag's voice made the sword stop just an inch from Issei's head. Penemu blinked in great intrigue upon hearing the voice that unleashed the gauntlet. He's not using his full power yet. Diedrag exclaimed, drawing even more of the cadre's attention. Although not only caught his attention. That, Issei asked, sitting down on the grass, to then fix her gaze on the gauntlet with great curiosity. You still haven't used your emotions to reach 100% of your current power. The dragon explained with great seriousness. The emotions, asked Issei, not quite agreeing with the idea. Do you remember how it ended last time? I almost got killed for just a measly raise. The brunette made his point, making the dragon sigh. It was my fault. Okay. Diedrag argued, causing the cadre to look between the two of them with both eyebrows raised. Diedrag cleared his throat, indicating that he had had enough of wasting time in stupid arguments. This sacred gear works not only with hard work. One of its secrets is that it links the wearer's emotions with power. But I was wrong in thinking that you would be the same as everyone else. What do you mean? The chestnut asked, getting up with great confusion. He took a couple of steps back making Penemu no longer able to hear her conversation, although she clearly looked curious about the subject. My wielders have always reached their limits using negative emotions. But I think you're different. The last fight made that clear to me. The dragon clarified with great seriousness. Then what do you propose? The brunette asked, raising an eyebrow. Use good memories to release your current limit. I believe that if you use positive emotions, you will awaken your full current potential. The dragon declared with a rather confident and confident tone. Good memories. Issei rubbed his hair, trying to remember something. Remember all the time you spent with Tiamat. Like you did that time with that ice job. The dragon commented with a certain grace in his words, causing a huge blush to break out on Issei's face. With my teacher. He yelled at the brunette, making it so Penemu could hear him. It's not going to work. I mean, I've had a good time, but. Shut up and do it the damn time. Diedrag yelled, not wanting to listen to those internal love conflicts in the middle of a fight. Eh yes. Issei answered quickly, closing her eyes deeply, while she tightly clenched both of her fists. Penemu watched him patiently, while a word mentioned by the brown-haired woman went through her head. So, did you have a teacher before me? She thought to herself, looking at him with a bit of intrigue that was reflected in his beautiful crimson red eyes. I don't think this will work, Issei whispered under his breath, clenching his fists even tighter as the memories of his time with Tiamat began to speed up his heart. What made her heart race, were her beautiful deep blue eyes, along with her beautiful smile and cute fangs. Also, he remembered that little happy time they spent in the snow together with his other dragon friends, and like a big flash, the memories of that night in his room after the fight against Kokobil also came back to his mind. How natural and free they both felt when playing with each other. Especially her. That he could tell from her smile. She didn't smile like that very often, but she always showed him a lot of affection when she was that kind of intimate with him. And. She was great. Undoubtedly great. Boost. Penemu couldn't help but blink in slight surprise as a small blizzard kicked up around Issei. Boost. A small blush came to her face as she kept remembering her moments with her. Boost. U A A A A A A A A A A A A A A A H H H H H H H. Issei's eyes glowed an intense crimson red, causing a massive blizzard of power to completely surround Issei. Boost, 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 boost. Penemu quickly covered herself and widened her eyes slightly at what she was witnessing. The surge of power was amazing. Boost, 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 boost. B O O S T O O O O O O O O O O O. Issei staggered to the sides with a face of complete astonishment after feeling how his power multiplied. Her armor glowed with a thin crimson aura, 
indicating that the power she radiated was no joke. While Issei looked at his hands in great astonishment, Henemu narrowed her eyes with great seriousness, and positioned her sword in front, ready to defend herself. Taking his blows is no longer an option, the Kadri thought carefully. So, Issei clenched his fists tightly with a smile. This is my limit at the moment. The brunette looked up from him, getting into a fighting position to attack Penemu. Now that I look at him very closely, his fighting stance is also very refined, the fall thought, then stared at his face. I see why you gave Kokobiel trouble. His serious words and no touch of emotion from him achieved their goal of reaching Issei's ears as a compliment, so he couldn't help but smile at him. Thank you. He replied with a toothy smile on his face, but it suddenly changed to a challenging smile. But I won't be more benevolent just for a few words. He exclaimed with great confidence, running at great speed towards her, who shattered the ground from her quick, strong dash. It's much faster, Henemu thought. Her face showed great tranquility, despite the fact that Issei's fist was about to hit her cheek. Just a millisecond before Issei's fist impacted her face, Henemu practically disappeared and appeared just a couple of centimeters further back than she was before, causing the punch to pass right in front of her face. This time, Issei was not surprised by his speed. In fact, he had already thought that the woman would dodge him. So easily, the brown-haired man quickly continued with his plan, and tried to tackle him with his leg, which Penemu dodged with a big jump without any problem. At that moment, Issei quickly appreciated in front of her and tried to punch her that the Kadri dodged, making her body to one side of her. At that moment, Penemu tried to counterattack with his sword, but Issei managed to dodge the attack by the hair, receiving a small tear in the side of his armor, in the part of his abdomen. Seeing that her punch had no effect, Penemu quickly crossed her sword in front of her to block Issei's next punch. Because of her, she never thought that Issei was waiting for that moment. The brunette's eyes widened, adjusting the trajectory of his blow just in time, causing the punch to land at an upward angle, instead of hitting him head on. Penemu couldn't help but blink in slight surprise as the immense force of the blow broke through her defenses, and she flung both her hands helplessly into the air, leaving herself completely exposed. Now. Issei thought, clenching both of her fists tightly. A massive barrage of punches landed directly at Penemu's face with a frenzy and sheer speed, making it impossible for anyone Issei to have faced so far to dodge. The punches were coming so fast, they were barely visible even to him. Still, something amazing happened. In some inexplicable way, Penemu's face moved even faster than his punches, dodging the dozens of blows that went to her face with just the movement of her neck and head. The precision and speed was such that Issei couldn't realize it until it was too late. Out of nowhere, Penemu brought her sword back down, causing Issei's fists to crash hard against the metal. Issei didn't even have time to reply, as in less than a second, the woman had already turned her sword around with an exceptional movement of her hand, driving it deep into the side of Issei's abdomen. At that moment, everything slowed down for Issei as he watched as the sword was going through his body. But how? He thought the brunette with his eyes widening in complete shock. The weather returned to normal, causing both of them to descend from the sky and land on the ground, although it was visibly seen who fell better. While Penemu landed with the grace of a cat, Issei miraculously fell to his feet, staggering as he grasped the wound that ran through her body with both hands. Her gaze was downcast and completely obscured, making it impossible to tell what she was thinking. Penemu slightly narrowed her eyes, to then abandon her attack posture when she saw how Issei's body trembled. It's natural that she doesn't have any kind of tolerance for pain. She barely had two real fights, if I can consider the fight against Razor as a real one, she thought seriously, then began to slowly approach, ready to finish the fight. She patiently approached, until she was in front of Issei. Penemu pointed her sword at him, turning it with her hand to drive the point into the other side of her abdomen convinced that that magnitude of pain would give her victory after Issei fell in a faint. Penemu tried to pierce him with her thrust, being dodged when Issei's body moved to the side. The woman couldn't help but blink with some confusion at what she had witnessed. Thinking that it had only been a coincidence, she again settled, trying to cross him again on the other side. The attack failed again, so her attacks quickly became more frantic and fast, all of them being dodged by the chestnut. Fed up with the situation, I try to stab him in the center of his abdomen. That, 
Penemu blinked in complete surprise as his long, silky hair fluttered from the huge blizzard that blew up around them, due to Issei having parried the sword with both hands like the first time. The brown-haired man looked up with a big defiant smile, while a trickle of blood slipped from his mouth. That expression only made Penemu even more surprised, so she couldn't react when Issei used the grip he had on her sword to throw it away from her. As was customary, Penemu turned with great skill in the air and landed gracefully on her feet, without taking long to fix her gaze on Issei. His eyes narrowed again in surprise. How can she move like that? She's only supposed to have had two official matches. After thinking about that, Issei's previous word came back to her mind. Who the hell was her previous master? She thought to herself with great intrigue and wonder. You are stronger than Kokobil. Issei exclaimed, not taking a second to run towards her, generating a tiny line of destruction along the way. The Kadri was again surprised, since Issei's speed had barely decreased a tiny bit from its full, being that he was somewhat damaged. Obviously, it also helped that Penemu was making sure not to harm an internal organ. Penemu blocked the punch with her sword then jumped slightly to avoid a kick and leaned her upper body back to avoid another punch. He quickly spun the sword in his hand, then moved forward and tried to slice through his midsection. The fall couldn't help but grit his teeth a little when he saw that Issei made his whole body backwards thanks to his knees, and even so he didn't lose his balance and was able to get back up the second, trying to punch him. Penemu swung her sword with impressive speed, parrying the attack and doing a small jump back to avoid another blow that was coming at his face. Penemu tried to cut it again instantly, looking surprised again when Issei gave a small jump back, falling to the ground, and then pushed off her with her hands, giving him a strong kick in the center of the sword that created a small shock wave. Penemu was thrown back several meters, but even so she seemed unaffected by the blow. As soon as Issei's foot touched the ground again, the brunette pounced against Penemu with an amazing momentum that shattered the ground. The fallen didn't even have time to land from the previous strike, as she had to cross her sword and create a magic circle. Issei's punch hit the magic circle with such force that it blew both their hair violently, generating a small shock wave along with a loud bang. As soon as Issei's foot touched the ground again, the brunette pounced against Penemu with an amazing momentum that shattered the ground. The fallen didn't even have time to land from the previous strike, as she had to cross her sword and create a magic circle. Issei's punch hit the magic circle with such force that it blew both their hair violently, generating a small shock wave along with a loud bang. As soon as Issei's foot touched the ground again, the brunette pounced against Penemu with an amazing momentum that shattered the ground. The fallen didn't even have time to land from the previous strike, as she had to cross her sword and create a magic circle. Issei's punch hit the magic circle with such force that it blew both their hair violently, generating a small shock wave along with a loud bang. It didn't take long for the magical barrier to break into a thousand pieces, but Issei's attack had already ceased by then. With the intention of not giving her rest, the brown-haired man pounced on her again, trying to deliver different blows to her face with her fists that Penemu was able to block with her sword. Seeing a small opening between her frantic attacks, Penemu quickly parried an attack and readjusted the direction of the sword with her hand, making a crosscut. Issei was able to dodge the attack by leaning her body like last time. Displaying not her flexibility, but her balance and grip strength. The brown-haired man got up again and began to attack again with his fast punches, all of them being deflected by the fall with the help of his sword. The cadre watched as her opponent's arms passed inches from his face with a blank look though his eyes seemed to reflect some interest in his skills. After being like this for a few seconds, Issei dealt a strong blow to the sword that sent it back a few meters. Penemu's eyes widened slightly as her ever-perfect stance faltered, as she had landed her foot on a large crack that had been generated from the combat. The brown hair did not go unnoticed, lashing out at her practically instantly. Despite her imbalance, Issei couldn't help but be impressed at how the woman managed to block all the attacks that were going to her face, even though she clearly looked quite held back. How annoying, Penemu thought with some astonishment, seeing that Issei was too frantic when it came to fighting, and didn't give breaks. Seeing that he was about to fall, Penemu knelt down in a quick movement, causing the brunette to slightly grit his teeth at the unexpected situation. Penemu quickly responded with a sweep of her sword, being dodged by Issei with a jump. Even so, the brunette had his back to the cadre, 
Sapenemu's eyes glittered dangerously at this. The fall rushed towards him, saying the following words. Dance of the eleven bloody grips. Eleven thrusts were fired at a rather amazing speed against Issei in the area of his torso. Even so, the brown-haired man was able to dodge each of the attacks, moving his body from one side to the other with great agility, despite having his back turned. Even so, in the last lunge, Issei ended up leaning back again thanks to his knees. But it seemed that Penemu was waiting for this moment. Now, La Cadre thought, turning her katana in less than a second, to hit him on the head with the blunt part, knowing that it was impossible for him to dodge. Just when he was about to deliver the coup de grace, Penemu's eyes blinked in slight surprise when the brown-haired man dropped his body, resting both hands on the ground, and then pushed himself up with the help of the ground to give him a strong kick, which Penemu managed to cover with her sword. Issei quickly unfurled his dragon wings and went to attack him immediately, giving him no rest. Penemu tried to compose herself in the air, but it was useless, since the chestnut's numerous kicks came quickly. Even so, the cadre was able to deflect all of her sword kicks. The contest continued like this for a few seconds, both being dragged along very quickly by the inertia of the blows, and the fact that they were not touching the ground only made it easier. Finally, Penemu blinked in complete surprise as Issei caught his sword between her feet on the last deflection from him, rendering her completely defenseless for a short second. And that second was more than enough. Oh. Issei yelled with great energy. Penemu could only watch as the chestnut's knee slowly approached, until she got a big knee to her chin that generated a big blizzard in the place, along with a small crater at her feet, despite the fact that they were not touching the ground. Penemu went flying at a great speed beginning to roll on the floor, being the first time in the entire fight that she did not land on her feet. The cadre raised her gaze slightly from the ground, looking at Issei with her typical stoic expression. A huge smile appeared on Issei's face at this. I was finally able to hurt you. She exclaimed, clenching her fist tightly. Hearing this, Penemu couldn't help but smile a little. But what are you saying? He asked the fall from him, rising slowly. From the ground, leaving his sword stuck in the ground. This was just warming up. He finished, doing a couple of stretches to his neck. That, Issei couldn't help but yell with his eyes wide open. Did that mean that that blow had done almost nothing to him? The cadre finally stopped stretching, opening her eyes again. Issei couldn't help but take a step back seeing her look. A look that indicated trouble. First, let me take this off. Penemu began to slowly open her robe. She's too annoying to move. She clarified herself, lowering the zipper to the level of her breasts, then yanking it off. Issei couldn't help but blush and cover his face with one hand. Ari are you seriously planning to fight in those clothes? Issei asked, taking a small gap between her fingers to look at the woman, as if she were a child seeing something she shouldn't. Of course, Penemu replied matter-of-factly, while he held the tunic with one hand. Issei couldn't help but look at how those tight bandages completely surrounded her breasts. Yes, he was completely surrounded and they left nothing in sight. But, they were so fucking tight they looked like they were about to burst. And despite being so tight, her breasts easily covered a good part of her upper torso. Ah despite being so tight, it was easy to see how the entire environment of those two huge mountains were perfectly balanced and supported indicating that her breasts had an exquisite shape despite their ridiculous size. First, Issei met a woman who had such a juicy and unmatched butt, being Tiamat herself. Now, he was in front of the biggest breasts, and, if that wasn't enough, they were also extremely perfect. Not only for its greatness, but also for its firmness. Definitely, her breasts were what stood out the most about her figure. Even so, all of her midriff stripped bare of her, and her behind being covered with a small black garment didn't leave much to be seen. And, despite having such large breasts, she could assure that her bottom was not far behind, though it clearly couldn't compare to Tiamat's pretty ass. Issei quickly shook his head. This is serious. He couldn't help but wonder internally. Why do two extremely perfect women have to show up right after they made that promise? She thought the chestnut, cursing the already deceased god for preparing such challenges against her word. Now, if I can move much better, Penemu closed her eyes deeply, doing a small stretch in her back, making Issei's eyes almost pop out of his sockets at her movements, since she looked very sensual. Finally, 
Hanamu took the sword and gave a small sigh. I don't need this anymore. She commented as if it were nothing to her, throwing the robe far behind her. At that moment, in this precise moment, it was then that Issei completely forgot about the incredibly gifted body in front of him. Because, because of that tunic, a huge explosion was heard behind Penemu, where the robe had fallen, causing the brunette to widen her eyes in complete shock. W what? The brown-haired man yelled at the top of his lungs after seeing how the tunic almost completely destroyed half of a small hill. Small violet rays began to completely surround Penemu, at the same time that she tightened her grip on her sword. The sword slowly began to be dyed with a purple aura, until finally it completely covered her. Seeing this, Issei couldn't help but look at her with great attention. Is she imbuing her sword with magical power? She thought the chestnut, to then flatly shake her head. Calm down Issei, surely that must have been some trick. The brunette quickly got into attack position, starting to sweat. She is a cadre, although they are very powerful. I have recently tasted the power of one, and it is impossible for them to move so fast if they are wearing clothing as heavy as that. The brunette concluded, swallowing hard to try to calm down. Issei quickly lunged at him, intending to punch him hard in the face. Penemu not only held back the punch very easily, but also knocked Issei back with her sword, displaying much greater strength than she did a few moments ago. Even so, the brunette didn't give up and lashed out again without wasting a second. Their kicks collided strongly, so that later their fist and sword collided at the same time, leaving Issei's arm below the sword. The brunette quickly pushed the sword up, creating an opening similar to the one before. When he saw that her chest was free, he tried to hit it hard with his other fist, but was surprised by a cut that barely grazed his cheek, producing a long and deep horizontal cut along his entire cheek, causing him to scream loudly of pain and was thrown backwards. The wound began to bleed slowly, causing Issei to tremble in pain, as he sat down on the ground. Why do you cause so much pain? She asked aloud, resting her hand on his cut cheek, then seeing the blood, slightly surprised when a small purple streak shot out of the blood. Light energy, combined with the lightning attribute. Penemu swung his sword sharply, brushing away the traces of blood. Light energy is highly corrosive to demons. Now, add to that the fact that the beam transports said energy at a higher speed within the organism, in addition to producing a degree of pain ten times stronger than a normal light attack. To give it a plus, the sword allows magic to do much more damage, making a simple cut to the chest deadly. Although, some prefer to say that the sword can do much more damage thanks to magic. Well, anyway, both answers are valid, he concluded, showing off his knowledge. Hearing this, Issei could only smile and close his fist tightly. In short, the spears of light look like mere toys in front of that sword, he commented, stopping as he wiped the blood from his cheek. Penemu couldn't help but smile a little after hearing what she heard. And now, the cadre rested her sword on her shoulder. What are you up to? Hearing this, Issei's serious face turned into a smile. This, the chestnut yelled loudly. A second later, Magic circles appeared and completely surrounded Penemu, leaving her with no way out. At the same time, Issei quickly ran towards her to make sure that she didn't get away from her unscathed. Seeing that she was surrounded, Penemu closed her eyes serenely. I put them on the last time she attacked me. That's a brilliant idea. The cadre's eyes widened a little, denoting a dangerous glint in them. Nevertheless, just as Issei and the magic circles were about to attack her, Penemu brought her sword down from her shoulder, lighting up bright purple. After that, the following words could be heard coming out of her beautiful lips. Shell of rays. After saying those words, Penemu began to spin on herself at a speed never seen before, causing a strange purple light to completely surround her. The attacks from the magic circles were deflected as soon as they came into contact with the spinning sword, while Issei hit the energy hard, causing it to start spinning at great speed. The entire armor began to be damaged rapidly, until it was completely broken. Then, Issei's clothes slowly tore, giving them various not very deep cuts around his entire body. Finally, Issei was thrown backwards, crashing to the ground, apparently unconscious. Surrounding your enemy with magic circles is useless, if said opponent is almost six times stronger than you. He exclaimed the cadre, dematerializing the sword, and turning around. I guess he expected too much, 
he commented, starting to walk away slowly. The silence was present for a few seconds, only being interrupted by Penemu's footsteps. Until finally, oh where are you going? The deep red glow and the voice forced Penemu to look sideways at him, seeing that he had materialized the armor again. I didn't want to use this, because I was worried about you, the brunette stated, getting up slowly with obvious difficulty. But now, I'm not afraid of hurting you a lot, knowing how strong you are. He exclaimed the brown-haired man with a somewhat dangerous smile on his face, while a medium-sized ball of energy began to form in his hand, taking away a large part of his magical reserves. The ball completely covered his hand, being the size of a football. The amount of magic used is pathetic, Penemu thought, turning around to look at him with great attention. But, that color and that shape remind me of something, she concluded, pointing her sword at Issei. The chestnut made his hand back with a lot of energy. Don't blame me if you end up really hurt by this, he yelled, running full speed against her. Penemu watched with great calm as he approached her, surrounding herself again with that aura and purple rays. Come on, DDRAIG, Issei yelled, reaching his hand out for the woman's sword. Dragon shot. Hearing those two words, Penemu quickly widened her eyes as she couldn't and grabbed Issei's arm tightly to divert the attack towards the sky from one moment to the next, causing Issei to widen his eyes in complete shock at not even being able to witness his move. In fact, she swore that she hadn't even moved a few moments ago. Penemu dragged Issei to the side quickly by the arm and knocked him to the ground, pounced on him while holding the tip of her katana inches from his face. Finally, a huge deafening explosion shook the entire place, causing the crimson-red color to blind everyone in the forest. After several seconds, the screeching sound of the explosion finally disappeared, at the same time that the blinding crimson light began to give ground. The first thing Issei could see, was Penemu's beautiful face inches from his, as she held her sword inches from his face. They both shared a penetrating look for a short second, until finally the cadre spoke. That could have hurt me a lot, he commented, getting up and offering Issei his hand. Oh, Issei took the hand in slight surprise at the gesture. Thanks, I guess, Issei rubbed at his hair with a nervous smile, then her eyes widened wildly. Wait, does that mean, a small smile appeared on Penemu's face. Congratulations, Issei. The fall placed a hand on the brunette's head. You passed. End of chapter. Chapter 21. The Headquarters of the Fallen Angels. Open the mouth, Penemu said to Issei giving him a phoenix tear to heal. Issei was shirtless sitting in the middle of the meadow where they had fought, while Penemu was kneeling in front of him. The brown-haired man heaved a deep sigh when he felt the stinging pain from all his wounds disappear, especially where he had been pierced in his abdomen. Seeing that Issei's wounds healed pleasantly, Penemu immediately placed both of her hands on his chest, making the brown-haired man a little nervous at such a sudden touch. Hum. Penemu squeezed the chestnut's pectorals lightly, and then slowly went to his abdomen. Her body is well worked out, but her muscles aren't very firm. That means it must not have started long ago, she thought, squeezing Issei's abdomen with a little force. How long ago did you start training? She looked away from her torso after her question, raising an eyebrow when she saw that Issei had a small blush on her face. Sorry, I see you're not so used to having your body touched. She concluded herself, removing his hands from her. D don't worry about it, Issei commented, rubbing at her hair. In answer to your previous question, I have started my training two and a half months ago, more or less. Two and a half months. Penemu put a hand to her chin, muttering to herself. I thought there were about six months. That means she had some very exhaustive training at some point. A somewhat dangerous gleam graced her beautiful crimson eyes. That might make a few things easier. Issei could only look at her with a nervous drop of sweat, since he didn't understand exactly what she was talking about, although he felt a little chill when he heard her last words. I still have a question for you. But first, I'd like you to meet the other person who will help us in your training. Hearing this, Issei couldn't help but get a little excited. Would he be as strong as Penemu? He was anxious to know. Speaking of him, Penemu looked up at the nearby mountain causing Issei to do the same. Issei's eyes widened in shock when he saw how a huge dragon soared above the mountain, in an imposing flight. Finally, 
The huge blizzard stopped as he landed in front of the two of them, placing both hands on his waist. Issei could see that he had a very muscular appearance, and a bit more humanoid than Tiamat in Diedrag's form. Her torso was completely grey, while her arms, head, and back shone a rather conspicuous violet colour. Her black-coloured eyes and golden-coloured horns and nails highlighted her figure, giving her an imposing appearance, if her height itself wasn't something to worry about. Have you finished your little game yet, Henemu? The booming voice made Issei even more shocked. Sorry if I interrupted, but I was getting bored already. She finished, carefully fixing her gaze on the young Issei. Don't worry, answered Penemu with her eyes closed. We recently finished the match. Upon hearing that, the huge dragon smiled a little, and then a great glow adorned it, making its figure smaller and smaller. Issei watched in shock as the dragon took on a human form. Although she was more in shock to learn that he was really a dragon, due to the story that Tiamat had told her about his species. I I don't get it. Issei rubbed his hair with many questions. Dragons are on the brink of extinction. How come? At that moment, Issei's eyes widened in disbelief. So you figured it out, mate? Diedrag asked, chuckling at Issei's lost expression. Do you know about dragons? Penemu raised an eyebrow with mild interest. Since I had heard that you recently entered the world of the supernatural, I thought that you would not be aware of it. That makes things a lot easier. The thin and somewhat grotesque voice broke through the brightness, causing both of them to look closely at the dragon. Then you should know by now that I am Tannen, one of the two surviving dragon kings. The glow disappeared, revealing a young man with purple eyes and spiky purple hair, wearing a white suit and purple tie. Tannen was holding onto the front of his hair, making the beauty in his face quite noticeable, as was his voice. Like Tiamat, Tannen had an appearance of around 25 perhaps a little bigger at about 27. It's good to see you again, my friend. Diedrag's voice echoed through the gauntlet, causing Issei to look at him in slight surprise. Same here, Diedrag, Tannen commented, crossing his arms. You've been through better days, but it's always great to have a little chat with a friend. She concluded herself, giving him a small smile. Tannen's smile instantly faded as he fixed his gaze on Issei. So, you are the bearer of Diedrag. Tannen studied him with his eyes for a few seconds. I would prefer you call me Issei. She commented the brunette, getting up as he extended his hand. I don't feel comfortable being called, Diedrag Bearer. It's quite awkward. Tannen seriously looked at his hand for a few seconds, until he finally shook it. I'll keep calling you Diedrag Bearer, until you prove yourself. The Dragon King commented very seriously, indicating that it would not be easy to achieve it. Hum. Very good, Issei replied, not intending to make his teachers uncomfortable. I'll take care of improving your ability and your control over the sacred gear. Penemu pointed to herself, then to Tannen. He'll take care of the brute force part. It'll be more strength and endurance training, not so much muscle. She finished, then looked closely at her chest again. That reminds me of the question I wanted to ask you, Lakadri looked him closely in the eyes. Who was your previous master? Uh, well, they both looked at Issei with a raised eyebrow when they saw that he got a little nervous. I don't know if they will believe me. They don't have to believe you. The gaze of the three went to the top of the nearest mountain. The evidence is right here, declared Tiamat herself, sitting on top as she wore a huge proud smile that highlighted her beautiful fangs. The wind swayed her long, silky hair, giving her the appearance of a true goddess. Before Issei could even say his name, Tannen shot out, at the same time his body reverted to a dragon. Tiamat, let's fight. The dragon king yelled loudly, flying at full speed towards him, causing Penemu to have to hold Issei so he wouldn't fly away. Tiamat regarded the dragon with a bored look, then disappeared. Silence. He ordered the beautiful woman, at the same time that she gave him a huge punch on her cheek. Tannen's face trembled like jelly as a huge icy blast ring broke loose from the blow, destroying everything in its path. Finally, Tannen's eyes rolled back and he slowly fell to the ground, while his face continued to shake violently from such a blow that would have killed anyone but him. Are you okay? Penemu asked, to an Issei who was slightly blushing having her face between his breasts. It wasn't her fault that the cadre was almost two meters tall. Line jump. If Azazel was hardly ever surprised or impressed, 
then it could be said that this time was one of the few times that the fallen leader could be seen with his eyes wide open. He was trained by Tiamat. Azazel banged on the table, unable to believe what he was hearing. Ah, I had a hard time believing it at first. Sirzex commented calmly, before giving a nervous smile. Although I was able to accept it much faster, since the first time I saw her she seemed to want to kill me. Azazel slowly dropped his, shocked gaze, then rested his elbow on the table, as he dropped his face into his hand. What you're telling me is impressive, there's no doubt about it. Not only because we're talking about a dragon king who gave almost no clues to his whereabouts in the last 2000 years, with hardly a single sight being seen, or twice to kill the Deedrake wielder. And just, that's the second point that I can't believe, Azazel raised both eyebrows in immense curiosity. How did Tiamat and the bearer of Deedrake manage to become friends? I haven't the faintest idea. Sirzex bowed his shoulders, causing Azazel to put a hand to his chin. Although they have known each other for more than a month, I found out a few days ago, and I did not have the opportunity to speak with Issei. The only thing I know is that in addition to being an apprentice and teacher, both have a great friendship between them. Quote, a great friendship, huh? Azazel thought, rubbing his chin with a strange smile on his face. Anyway, I'm sure you didn't come just to let me know what kind of training my sister's entourage would have, and Hyoto's private life. Sirzex narrowed his eyes slightly. Oh I'm wrong. Azazel closed his eyes and chuckled slightly at the question. As faction leaders, we both know exactly why we're here. He concluded, outlining a serious look for the first time in the talk. The brat already knows about the prophecy. Not yet. Sirzex replied, turning serious. Even so, the angels have already contacted me to take him to heaven. I told them that he's in the middle of intensive training right now so they'll come looking for him when he's done. I agree. Azazel nodded, lowering his head a bit. The burden for the brat will be immense. But you have to know. Sirzex commented quickly. The extinction of two races is no joke. Don't make me remember. Azazel huffed in slight disgust. Line jump. I see. So you've come to see how everything is going. Tannen commented already in his human form with a big smile, seeing that his cheek was completely swollen. Yeah. Tiamat nodded, watching from afar as Penemu seemed to be explaining something to Issei. It reassures me to know that you trust her. But still, I won't let my guard down. The dragon would cross her arms, while a hard look crossed her face. I'm not going to leave Issei alone. Tannen couldn't help but look at her in surprise. I see that you and the Deedrake wielder get along very well. A toothy smile spread across her face. I'm glad to know that after two millennia you managed to find someone to help you. A small smile appeared on Tiamat's face after her words. You're right. I was very lucky. She commented the dragon very fondly, making Tannen even more surprised when she saw that there was a small blush on her face. Finally, Tannen simply deigned to smile, not wanting to pester her with intimate questions. If he makes you so happy, I don't think I need to worry about the brat being a devil. The underdeveloped lizard took it upon himself to silence the demonic corruption. In fact, it looks much more like a dragon than a demon. The dragon commented with some grace in her last words. Well, that remains to be seen, Tannen commented with a subjective smile. If it's really like a dragon, then it can handle the second part of Penemu's training. Your method is dangerous, Tiamat instantly asked upon hearing that Issei could get hurt. It's very dangerous. She declared the dragon as if it were nothing. But that's okay. You can't expect radical improvement with a conventional method. I'm telling you right away that if something smells bad to me, I'll intervene immediately. Tiamat threatened, giving Penemu a murderous glare. And if she survives my attack, it's only. Because I'll have the consideration that she's your friend. More than a friend, she is an acquaintance. She answered the dragon quickly. Anyway, don't worry too much. She commented calmly. I've known Penemu and Azazel for quite some time. They're good people, despite being fallen angels. Tiamat narrowed her eyes with great suspicion, staring at Penemu. If you say so, what do you think you need to become stronger? What will you use? How will you achieve it? Penemu's questions took Issei by surprise. Well, to become stronger I need to train. As for what I will use, it will be my boosted gear. And I will achieve it exploiting the greatest potential of my sacred gear. Issei replied, 
rubbing her hair when he saw that her answers didn't seem to have pleased Penemu. So, you think all your power revolves around your boosted gear? Penemu asked, receiving a nod from him. Does that mean you settle for being the weakest Sekiryote? That, Issei widened his eyes. Of course not. Listen to me well, because I'm only going to say it once. Penemu took a step forward of her, making the brunette look at her very carefully. It doesn't matter that you're the Sekiryote. It doesn't matter that you have one of the most feared powers in history. It doesn't matter what people think of you. It doesn't matter at all. If you want to be someone no matter who you are right now, then you should always keep three things in mind to strengthen yourself. Penemu raised three fingers to emphasize her words, receiving a quick nod from the brunette. Mind, heart, and body. The answer completely upset Issei, since she did not understand what she meant. Mind. You have to discover for yourself how to overcome what seems insurmountable. Issei blinked in great surprise at his words. To achieve this, you always have to be cold-headed and think until you break your head. Something that has never been achieved until now, something that has no precedent. That something is what you yourself will find to become someone stronger. Penemu moved a little closer to her face, making sure he heard her well. Listen to me carefully. Even if that something has never been discovered or created, it doesn't mean that you can't achieve it. He concluded, placing a finger on her forehead, to then receive a big nod from the brown-haired man. Heart. Because despite the fact that you are putting your brain into the matter, you have to believe that it is possible. You have to try, try, and try again even if it seems impossible. It does not matter that you cannot visualize the end of the road, you have to continue going forward. Penemu placed her hand on Issei's shoulder, squeezing it gently. Because if you don't believe in yourself, if you don't believe in your own potential, then who will? Issei this time didn't even nod, he just deigned to look at her completely amazed by her words. Lastly, body. It is useless to have a strong mind and heart if your body does not meet the expectations of what you aspire to achieve. If your body is not in tune with your spirit, then there is nothing you can do. For that, no excuses, no being the Sekiryote. Penemu plunged a finger into the brunette's chest to emphasize her next words. Your body is not something that is the work of fate. Your body is forged by yourself. Seeing that Issei didn't answer, Penemu looked at him penetratingly. Did you understand? Hearing her question, Issei nodded quickly, before getting a little serious. Since you're just starting your training, I'll help you align these three points. There will be a time, though, when I can't help you anymore, and you'll have to keep looking for answers on your own. Issei simply nodded at his words. To begin, I'd like you to tell me what your favorite melee weapon is, or if there is one you'd like to use. Melee weapon. Issei put a hand to his chin, to then look at Penemu's katana and remember the various trainings and fights he had against sword users. I like swords, he concluded, outlining a small smile. What class? The cadre asked causing Issei to rub his hair at not finding an answer. Lighter, heavier, big, small, she added herself, getting Issei to understand. I would like a light sword, she exclaimed with a big smile. Because, she asked herself, seeing if she had really thought about her answer. Well, as a swordsman, I would like to move very fast and be very agile. He answered, not quite sure of his answer though he quickly knew that he had answered correctly when Penemu smiled at him. Good choice. Penemu nodded in satisfaction, before materializing a wooden sword. Here. It's a katana. The cadre explained, holding the gun close to him. Uh, thanks, he replied, taking the wooden sword in a very strange way. To start with the training, we'll start with your ability and control over the sacred gear. Penemu clarified with great simplicity, closing her eyes. Wait. Can we do both at the same time? The brunette asked, completely impressed. Of course. He answered the cadre as if it were the most natural thing in the world. You just have to activate your balance breaker. After her words, Issei quickly surrounded himself with a red color, taking his armor. And now that, the brown-haired man asked excitedly. Now, you have to stay in the armor for as long as possible. You can't even take it off to sleep. Okay. Wait. What? Issei's eyes bulged out of her sockets upon hearing what she should do. B but I can barely last a few minutes with the armor on. You need to increase your control, 
and since you won't be in combat, the armor will last longer. Just don't use magic, and even if you're completely exhausted and about to faint, don't turn it off. Penemu gave him a somewhat cold look, making the brunette take a step back. Believe me, the punishment will be much worse than the accumulated mental exhaustion. Therefore, try to accumulate much more fatigue than punishment for your own good. He concluded, making Issei almost choke on his own saliva. We haven't been together for even a day, and I already know that she is much more demanding than Tiamat, the brown-haired man thought with fear. Now, regarding the skill, Penemu drew her katana, getting into a combat stance. I will teach you my stance and the various attacks that you can handle at this time. When you have perfected it, you yourself will look for a way to combine your fighting stance with the stance of the katana. I tell you that it will not be something very easy, but if, if you manage to combine two different styles, you will become monstrous. Not by strength or ability, but by level. He concluded, receiving a nod from the brunette. Now, we will focus on a regular training that lasted from early morning until lunchtime. After that, Tannen will take over the second part. Penemu narrowed her eyes slightly, tightening her grip on his sword even more. Understood. Yeah. Issei answered quickly, trying to imitate Penemu's posture. I'll go see from afar. Tannen regarded Tiamat in mild astonishment. I don't want to disturb your training. She finished, spreading her wings as she headed up the mountain, being followed by Tannen. Several hours later, I think I'm going to throw up. Issei commented, as his face grew whiter and whiter. Not only was it the urge to vomit, but she also had very intense dizziness, along with a headache that wasn't very bad, but managed to be very annoying. It's normal. It's one of the symptoms that appears when your magical reserves are constantly nearing their limit. Penemu explained, taking a piece of meat from the fire, placing it on her plate very subtly. But it's just that, a symptom. You can rest easy, because you won't vomit. It's just a mere sensation. She clarified herself, taking a bite to her mouth, closing her eyes in satisfaction. Now, take the opportunity to rest and don't overexert yourself. A small amount of saliva came out at the corner of the chestnut's lips when he saw the food, at the same time that he roared loudly. Speaking of which, I haven't eaten anything all day. Issei was going to take his share of food, but was interrupted by Penemu when she hit him with her katana sheath. Ow. What was that? The brown-haired man asked, while he rubbed his cheek from the blow. You broke your balance breaker about four times, so you will only receive a fifth of your food. Penemu replied with a dark look on her face, causing Issei to start sweating like crazy. Quote dot dot dot. This is the punishment. He thought the chestnut, while his eyes trembled at what he heard. Penemu proceeded to cut a small piece of the beast to hand it over, but Issei's armor broke at just the right moment causing the cadre to look at Issei for a few seconds, before handing the food over to Tannen, who was arriving alongside, with Tiamat. No it can't be, the brown-haired man thought, while a huge depressive aura surrounded him completely. His completely downcast face quickly changed, putting his armor back on. Are you ready for the second part of the training yet? Tannen asked, devouring all the food with breathtaking speed, causing Tiamat to roll her eyes. Just give me a few seconds the brown-haired man commented closing his eyes deeply as he tried to contain the immense headache he was having right now okay he answered the dragon sitting down in front of the cadre hey you still haven't told me why you guys are hanging around here azazel has been chasing hyodo for several weeks while i am trying to fulfill something entrusted to me a long time ago answered penemu not wanting to give him much more information than necessary I get it, everyone has their secrets. She commented the dragon simply, as she used a small splinter to clean her teeth. Now that I remember, why do you, Penemu and Azazel get along so well? Issei asked, making everyone look at him at his question. After all, I know that the dragons have a great hatred of the three factions because of the war that was waged against them. I would also like to know that story. Tiamat clarified, sitting on Issei's lap. Well, Tannen's face immediately turned serious. Let's just say. Those times were difficult. Tannen looked up from him, vividly remembering everything that had happened at that time while the other two tried to stop him. Seeing this, thanks to the help of God and the other two dragon gods, they managed to restrain Trihexa and seal him in a gigantic dimensional prison. 
Unfortunately, God died by sealing an opponent thousands of times superior to him. Seeing the enormous danger that dragons posed, the three factions made peace and ended the war, forming a truce to kill all dragons that posed a threat. That was how the Dragon Slayer, Brand, came to be. Even so, his incredible skill was not enough to kill the Dragon Kings. God died by sealing an opponent thousands of times superior to him. Seeing the enormous danger that dragons posed, the three factions made peace and ended the war, forming a truce to kill all dragons that posed a threat. That was how the Dragon Slayer, Brand, came to be. Even so, his incredible skill was not enough to kill the Dragon Kings. God died by sealing an opponent thousands of times superior to him. Seeing the enormous danger that dragons posed, the three factions made peace and ended the war, forming a truce to kill all dragons that posed a threat. That was how the Dragon Slayer, Brand, came to be. Even so, his incredible skill was not enough to kill the Dragon Kings. Hearing the last part, Issei couldn't help but look at him in great confusion. Wait. Tiamat had told me that with the help of Brand and the other factions they had eliminated two dragon kings. That's true, Tannen commented quickly, but it's only half information. No wonder, since the little idiot was isolated in a cave for almost two millennia. Tannen sneered, receiving a small growl from the dragon who quickly calmed down when Issei nuzzled her head. Although Brand was quite an impressive invention with a very dangerous sacred gear, he was not even close to defeating two dragon kings. So how did you do it? Tiamat asked with a small blush, feeling the constant caresses in his hair. A traitor. It was the simple answer that made everyone tense, due to the look that Tannen had. A traitor of our own blood. The dragon slightly clenched his fists after remembering. That bastard was called Samael. He cowardly joined the fallen angels so they wouldn't kill him, at the same time he delivered a poison that was capable of killing even the weakest dragon goddess, Ophis. That poison was known as, the blood of Samael. A small smile appeared on the dragon's face after remembering how he had killed it. Each of my brothers fought furiously and completely hotly against the factions. They thought that all dragons would be easy prey due to their temperament, but things turned out a little differently. After all, Tannen, pointed to his own head with a sly smile. Of all the dragons that existed, I was the only one who always had a cold mind, not counting Great Red. He explained with great pride. When the attack began, I planned my counterattack from the shadows, coldly calculating which threads to destroy. Finally, I dealt with Samael first, and all his poisons. I made sure to destroy all substances and stores, so I if there are any injections left, they must have been lost long ago. The dragon crossed his arms, puffing out his chest with pride. Discovering that the warehouses had been completely destroyed, the first to want to withdraw were Penemu and Azazel. Seeing that the two strongest subjects of their faction were not continuing the war, the fallen angels ended up withdrawing. After that, the angels and demons tried to attack me to kill me, but even that brand guy couldn't scratch me. Tannen closed her eyes with a small smile. Ultimately, the demons were the last to surrender and gave me a large piece of land to make the treaty work. Tiamat opened her mouth, but Tannen raised her arm quickly. I know what you're thinking. I was also very angry, and I wanted to kill them all. But I had promised Penemu and Azazel that I wouldn't exterminate the factions when they gave me more than half of the locations of the warehouses that contained the poison. Wait, they betrayed their own people? Issei asked with wide eyes. Believe me, kid, war is horrible, answered Penemu simply. Azazel and I agreed that everything should end once and for all. We were both fed up, and for that reason we found a solution. In this way, the dragons were not completely extinguished, and the factions did not suffer further casualties. Unnecessary. The Kadri fought back, causing Tiamat and Issei to look at her in slight surprise. That's why we get along so well. They both looked at Tannen after his words. Ah, despite being a dragon, I'm not overly passionate about battles, I don't let myself be controlled by my emotions, and I like to live quietly. While Penemu and Azazel don't let their more twisted tastes get the better of them, despite of being fallen angels. He concluded the dragon, outlining a small smile. Enough talk. Penemu interrupted the conversation, making everyone look at her. It's time for you to resume your training. She commented very calmly, before placing her small cup on top of her plate. 
Tanan strongly bumped his fists with a somewhat worrying smile, according to Issei. Let's go there. Line jump. I thought this would be so much simpler. Issei yelled loudly, as she ran at full speed with a huge rock tied to her waist. Meanwhile, Tanan could be seen flying behind him, using one of his fingers to throw small magical attacks at them, which ended up turning into huge explosions. Being in a wasteland, at least they made sure not to destroy too much nature, although the site seemed to be completely infertile in just two or three days. Several hours later, finally, the training with Tannen was over. Something that impressed the chestnut a bit, since they finished at an hour much earlier than he would think, although eight in the evening is not that little for him. In fact, he was partly grateful to be able to rest for a couple of hours. Without a doubt, running for your life all the time makes dizziness take a backseat, the brunette whispered, leaning against a tree as he sighed heavily. His armor was very dirty, as was his face. There were even a few times that I thought he would die. Issei kept advancing towards the campfire, to then see with slight surprise how Penemu had brought a large wooden table, along with a large number of books and papers. The cadre was sitting quietly at the tip, sipping tea with great delicacy. What are you doing? The chestnut asked, sitting at the other end. Working, was Penemu's simple response, while she read a book and signed certain papers. The order in Grigori will not maintain itself. But, that much work. He thought the chestnut with wide eyes. I thought that in the leaders there were many more cadres. That's how it is. Penemu nodded, as she inked her quill. The problem is that nobody does anything. The only one who does something from time to time is Azazel, and right now he's too relaxed. I have no choice but to do it myself. But doesn't that look bad to you? The chestnut asked, bringing a chessboard that was in front of him. I can't expect much from a couple of useless who only think about sex and waging wars. These statements made Issei remember Kokobil. Remember, Kyoto. Penemu looked up from her, setting the quill aside. There are times when it is better to be alone than in bad company. Saying this, the tall and beautiful woman got up from her seat, sitting next to Issei. Now, would you like to play a game? Although it had been a question, Issei could see how her eyes glowed longing for the answer to be positive. In fact, she looked quite cute, for someone so serious. This made Issei feel much more comfortable, seeing that she wasn't always going to see him as her student. And, on top of that, it was impossible to refuse such a proposal with those beautiful crimson eyes that glowed pleadingly in the dark. Very good, I'm the white ones, she exclaimed the cadre quickly and with a hint of emotion, causing the brunette to look at her in genuine surprise. As soon as they finished positioning their pieces, Penemu let her wings blacker than night sprout from her back, making the chestnut admire them for the second time. He was sure that those wings were even more wonderful than those of Azazel himself. In this battle, we are pure again, my dears. Penemu declared with a rather adorable seriousness, as he pushed a pawn forward. What do you mean by that? The brown wondered internally, to then widen his eyes slightly when finding the answer. Of course, the purity of his wings. You can take off your armor if you want. Penemu's words snapped Issei back to reality. Initially I told you that I didn't want you to take it off, but I know very well that in the first few days it will be impossible for you to keep it active even when you sleep. At the very least, I will be understanding until the seventh day. She commented, stroking her wings delicately as she eagerly waited for her to move. It would be great if he had that spirit not only when he played. The brown-haired thought, genuinely smiling at the rather cute acts of the cadre. Several days later, at last, Issei exclaimed with joy, seeing that after a week she could finally eat even a little food at noon. As was the custom, Tiamat was sitting on his lap, eating with him. The first time, Tannen and Penemu passed him by unnoticed. But now, the dragon couldn't help but wonder what was happening between the two, since Tiamat was never someone who was characterized by showing so much the most affectionate side of her. The brown-haired man took a big bite of the piece of meat, so that later his face turned a little purple. It's burned, she thought, immediately looking for water. I guess she's not very good at cooking. She concluded herself, then was slightly surprised when she saw that Penemu was much more distant than usual. He was looking at her for a few seconds, seeing how her face couldn't hide a sadness, while her gaze was lost in nothing, probably because of a distant memory. 
Hanamu came to herself after a few seconds, to then look at Issei after feeling his gaze. The brunette became visibly nervous, although he managed to quickly avert his gaze so as not to disturb the cadre. After a few seconds, the brunette looked at her out of the corner of his eye again. I suppose everyone has their own problems, she thought, as she coaxed a tiny smile from Tiamat as she began to stroke her long, pretty hair. That same day, at night, a great number of hours had passed, and Issei was finally done with his training. Lately he was doing better with his balance breaker thing, although now it would be considerably complicated, knowing that he had to have it on even while he slept. Luckily, there is also a stream in this place. I couldn't live with this dirt on me, the brown-haired man said to himself, as he moved through the trees. Night reigned in the woods, making vision in the place almost dim, though that wasn't a problem for a demon. Issei stopped abruptly after hearing some strange sounds. The brunette remained motionless for a few seconds, until he could distinguish what kind of sounds they were. Upon distinguishing it, the brown-haired man couldn't help but slowly widen his eyes. Are sobs, he thought to himself, moving slowly towards the direction of the sound. Issei hid behind a tree, then widened his eyes when he saw Penemu. She was completely alone, as she stared at the moon without blinking. The light from the above made her figure look majestic at night, although the tears that were running down her face made her image look a little less. Issei only deigned to observe how the cadre placed both hands on her chest while she tightly closed her eyes, letting the tears fall silently. Seeing this, Issei quickly turned around. Aren't you going to help her? Diedreg asked, puzzled by his partner's attitude. It's none of my business. I wouldn't want to bother her for meddling in her business. Issei replied, making Diedreg smile. And at what point did you start wondering about that? Diedreg's question made Issei stop dead, then look over her shoulder as Penemu was still there, crying, all alone. The brown-haired man clenched his fists tightly, before turning around and heading towards her. Penemu's eyes widened after hearing a strange sound, quickly turning her gaze. Who's there? The cadre ordered, quickly wiping the tears from her face. It's me. It was Issei's simple answer, getting a little closer to her. Doing this, Penemu backed away from her out of sheer instinct. I saw it all. You don't have to hide it. Hearing this, the cadre couldn't help but look away. If you want, we can talk about it. You would not understand, was the woman's sharp response, looking fiercely into her face. Leave me alone. Issei lowered his gaze for a short second, to then look at her seriously. You're right, I probably wouldn't understand. But you shouldn't tell me anything, just let me support you. Let me set you free. He commented the brunette, slowly approaching her while he faded her armor. Release me, Penemu laughed. Do you really think it can be that simple to do? Her eyes widened as she felt something warm surround her completely. She watched as Issei had forced her face to end up on her brown chest, while her other hand went around her back, enclosing her in a warm and strong hug. Penemu tried to break free at first, but quickly gave up and sighed heavily. Quote dot dot dot, isn't it necessary for me to tell you anything? No. Issei replied quickly, it's okay like that. Penemu's hands rose hesitantly, to then wrap around Issei's back with great force. She gave a big sobbing sigh, as she let the tears roll down her face again. Her wings emerged from her being, completely surrounding them both in an embrace so warm and perfect that it seemed like a portrayed work of art. It didn't take long for her to snuggle even. Closer in the embrace, making sure that her face was buried as much as possible in his chest so that he couldn't see her crying. It was quite a desperate attempt, since she hadn't thought how Issei could feel that her shirt was completely wet from said tears. I also have my own problems, and I know very well that crying alone does not relieve the damage that your heart feels. Issei began to caress his head, feeling how Penemu was clinging to him even more because of her gesture. At first I wanted to leave, but I just couldn't leave you alone. We've only known each other for a few days, but you've already selflessly helped me a lot, and I'd like to do something for you. I don't mind if you don't tell me what happened, just I care about helping you right now. Don't be afraid to lean on me. Don't be afraid to let go. Don't be afraid to be yourself. The brunette lowered her head a little, giving her a kiss on the forehead. I will simply deign to listen to you, each and every time you need it. Upon feeling the small kiss on her forehead, 
Henemu's silent crying ceased to be silent, feeling how her chest began to burn in such a beautiful way for such words. She responded to those beautiful words, hugging Issei even more with her wings, making them both stay even tighter, if that was possible. Among so many emotions and tears, he could only find one word to say to the chestnut. Thank you. Line jump. Are you feeling better already? The chestnut asked, seeing how Penemu was sitting next to her. Yeah, she replied, getting up while brushing off her little shorts. Do you feel like playing chess? The cadre asked, looking at him intently. Oh these hours. Issei's question made Penemu look at him in confusion. It's eleven at night. We were here three hours. Three hours. Penemu blinked in mild surprise at the information. Had you enjoyed the moment so much that you didn't realize the passing of time? But what does it matter? The cadre asked, outlining a small mocking smile. It's not that late, or do you want to tell me that you're a little baby that I can't stay awake that long? That, Issei couldn't help but look in various directions, while he searched for an answer. When he finally found her, the brunette fixed her gaze on Penemu, starting when the woman suddenly winked at him. Issei couldn't help but look away with a small blush, while Penemu covered her mouth to hide her small giggle. Hearing that she was laughing, Issei couldn't help but look at her carefully. You see it. Penemu stopped laughing after listening to the brunette. You're so much sweeter when you're free. Penemu couldn't help lowering her gaze, while a faint blush took over her cheeks. Issei could only smirk at seeing Penemu's tender reaction. Apparently, she was much more than just a strict and hardworking woman. Line jump. If you slow down, you're dead. Tannen exclaimed in his true form, as he launched magical attacks that brushed against Issei's rock, generating explosions and huge clouds of dust everywhere. I know. Damn it. He answered the chestnut, running at full speed, as if it were the marathon of his life. Neither of them had realized that two gazes were watching them from the top of a small mountain. How strange to see you around here. It was Tiamat's simple statement as he watched his future lover intently. I didn't have a lot of paperwork, so I jumped at the chance to look at it. She answered, having the same look as Tiamat. It looks like he's improved. I'm glad to see him. She added the dragon, not even giving the cadre a small glance. Noticing the discomfort in the environment, Penemu couldn't help but give a small sigh. Will we be like this forever? She asked herself, sitting down next to Tiamat. She moved away from her a little, giving her a not very friendly look. You may not be under the control of original sin, and Tannen is quite trusting of you. The dragon narrowed her eyes suspiciously. But you won't win my trust that easily. You're still a filthy drop, and that will never change. Believe me, he is more than anyone. Hearing her answer, Tiamat couldn't help but look at her in slight surprise, though she did not visibly see herself. And it's something that bothers me but I have no choice. My own mistakes have led me to this path, and now I'm paying the consequences. Everyone has made mistakes, I can't blame you for that. She declared the dragoness, looking at Issei. But he has taught me that you must learn to live with them, instead of regretting it all your life. Hyodo Issei. Penemu smiled slightly as she remembered what happened yesterday. Without a doubt, he is quite a strange and interesting boy. Hearing her words, Tiamat couldn't help but look at her with intrigue. You who know him best, what makes him act so deliberately? Why does he help people who don't deserve to be helped? Those are good questions, a small smile appeared on the dragon's face as she rested her chin on her knees. He has a gift for understanding other people's pain. And honestly, I don't know why he decided to help me when we first met. I guess there are people like him who just focus on healing people's hearts. There are no people like him. Penemu replied, causing Tiamat to look at her in mild astonishment. There is only him. Hearing his last words, Tiamat's surprise increased a little more, although she finally smiled. You're right. There is no other person as good, kind, happy, considerate and loving as he is. I totally agree. She declared the cadre, bringing a hand to her chest. He even helped someone like me. Do not get confused. She declared the dragon, rising from her seat. Issei may be a unique man, but he wouldn't help people who don't deserve his attention. Penemu couldn't help but look at her with great surprise at her words, and then close her eyes with a smile. Seriously, at what point did this tense conversation turn into such a lively one? Hearing this, 
Tiamat couldn't help but smile. Well, maybe you're not as bad as I thought at first, declared the dragon. I'm wondering the same, she answered, getting up. I thought you were only very close to Hyodo, but I see that you are quite an understanding woman. More or less, the dragon replied, tilting her head a little. Well, I must get on with the job, she declared the cadre, patting her behind to get the dirt off. They both stared at each other for a few seconds, then gave each other a small smile. Maybe, just maybe, Tiamat had found a new friend. Meanwhile, run faster, brat. Shut up you fucking underdeveloped lizard. Issei practically yelled at her gauntlet, making Diedreg laugh out loud. He had never had so much fun with one of its bearers, and he had to admit that it was a very pleasant feeling. A week later, we'll have a rest day tomorrow. He exclaimed the chestnut with great happiness, transmitting it to her dragon when he unconsciously hugged her tightly. Obviously, she couldn't see that a rather cheerful smile graced Tiamat's face, who seemed unwilling to leave his lap. That's how it is, Penemu agreed. Therefore, you can take off your armor now. Brilliant. He exclaimed the brunette with a big smile, vanishing his armor. But where shall we go? It's about time you used a real katana. Penemu looked up from her, staring at the brunette. We'll go to my room so you can choose one. A real katana. Issei couldn't help but get goosebumps, since he had been training with a wooden sword for more than two weeks, and he already wanted to feel like a real one. After the excitement passed, the chestnut couldn't help but be surprised to think back to the cadre's words. Wait a second, does that mean we're going to Grigori? Of course. Penemu nodded again, while he ate calmly. Again, the emotion was felt in Issei's body with a small shiver, since he had only heard that Grigori was a great fortress, but had never visited the site. I'll go with him. Tiamat's words practically sounded like an order, causing Penemu to look at her. I don't see a problem. Just try not to scare the fallen angels too much, answered Penemu, to then stare at her. Although I do warn you that you might feel a little uncomfortable around men. Tiamat just looked at her with a sharp smile, indicating that she might bring some trouble. Still, Penemu didn't seem to care. In fact, Issei was sure that he could see a small hint of satisfaction in his eyes. Somehow, that made him think that maybe he didn't get along so well with his fellow fallen. Line jump. We'll meet again, brat. Azazel commented with a sly little smile on his face, causing Issei to roll his eyes. What are you doing here? I thought you would oversee my classmates' training. Asked the chestnut. I do, he declared the fallen, looking at his fingernails. But this day I need to return to Grigori. At the beginning of next month there is a special event for our race. A special event? Issei asked with great interest. That's how it is. Azazel nodded. We commemorate the birth of the first fallen angel. It is an unprecedented event, where all the fallen angels travel by a small boat, while watching the fireworks that fall on Grigori. Issei only imagined how Penemu was riding on a small boat with all the fallen very tight, so it wasn't very cool for him. Speaking of which, Azazel fixed his gaze on Penemu with a smirk. Did you already find a partner, or will you be missing like every year? Hearing this, Penemu couldn't help but look away in slight annoyance, while Issei looked at her in slight confusion. Getting a partner, Issei put a hand to his chin, to then imagine Penemu in a small boat with a man. The brown-haired man couldn't keep imagining the situation, since the cadre pulled his sleeve. Issei understood the gesture instantly, so he stood on his toes as Penemu lowered her face to whisper in his ear. You use a decorated boat to surround Grigori with someone. It's a large number of boats, and the journey begins inside the only cave found. Azazel blinked a few times in genuine surprise upon seeing Penemu's gesture. This made him smile as he seemed to get along with someone other than himself. Well, if for some strange reason you happen to go, it would be nice to see you in a maid's dress. I'm sure it would look great on you. The fallen leader declared, then looked away and laughed when Penemu snarled at him, clearly disagreeing with that idea. Penemu in a maid outfit. Issei wondered, out loud, making them both look at him. The suit tight on her breasts, her weakly marked waist, and all her deep black hair along with her crimson red eyes. It was just a perfect combination. Issei's goofy grin disappeared almost instantly when he felt Penemu boring into him with her gaze. Do you think that dress would fit me? Well, the brunette put a hand to his chin, 
thinking carefully. Definitely not the type of outfit that would go with your personality, which is why I think it would look great on you. The brunette exclaimed, snapping his fingers with a big smile. He was slightly surprised when he saw that Penemu looked away with a small blush on her face. Azazel just watched the entire interaction with a smile on his face. Apparently, you even found more than what you were looking for, the cunning leader thought, as he watched as Penemu and Issei spoke matter-of-factly. I just hope he can help you with that, he concluded, flashing a very serious look at the end. I'm ready. Tiamat appeared next to Tannen, as he held out her arms, indicating that she had recently awakened. Without a doubt, she is, Azazel thought, narrowing his eyes. I see that the rumors about her absolute beauty among the dragons is no joke. A very voluptuous body, coupled with an impressive natural beauty, Azazel studied the dragon with his gaze, then smiled somewhat mysteriously. I just hope those idiots don't get too carried away, or they might end up dying. You will not come, the dragon asked, fixing her gaze on Tannen. I don't want to meet with murderers of my kind. He answered the dragon, bowing his shoulders. I would have if the Deedrade wielder was alone, but I'm sure you'll be very good company. You're right, she answered the dragon, smiling slightly and then giving her a sharp blow to her shoulder in parting from her, causing the dragon's eyes to widen greatly from her pain. Brat, you are surrounded by very special people, don't you think? Azazel asked, approaching the brunette. You are not the exception. Issei answered quickly, making Azazel smile. Line jump. A magic circle appeared in the middle of an area that was a complete plain, without any type of fauna and flora around it, except for the small stones that were found on the coast, marking the territory just before the enormous amount of water that was released. Rose in front of him, which ran freely in a circle, leaving a large expanse of land in the center with certain elevations. Azazel, Penemu, Issei and Tiamat appeared through the magic circle, seeing the place completely deserted. The only thing that stood out was a fairly large cave that connected the mini island in the center to where they were now. Probably, that cave is where that small stream came out, although the method is unpredictable. Where we are, the brunette wondered, looking in all directions. The sky was no longer purple, so he was sure they were on the mortal plane. We're in England, brat. Azazel replied, starting to move towards the top of the cave. This is where Grigori is located. Hey. Issei couldn't help but get confused. But, I don't see anything. You haven't broken through the magic barrier yet. Penemu answered, taking Issei by the hand and then pulling him inside, making him close his eyes when she felt like a kind of thick breeze passed through her body. The brunette blinked several times in slight confusion, before widening his eyes in complete shock. At the top of the cave, where nothing existed, there was now a huge upside-down D-shaped bridge, having quite a fantastic architecture that blended in with the bright dark color of the cave. Small lanterns surrounded the entire bridge, which must have covered it with a beautiful light at night. That wasn't the least bit surprising, when compared to what was behind said bridge. On the coast of the small island, a huge wall about 10 meters high, carved in brilliant white, was erected. As if that were not enough, inside the imposing wall, there was a huge castle with an extremely gothic appearance that extended along almost the entire island, fitting perfectly with the small unevenness of it, creating a wonderful structure. In the small towers of the castles, you could see how a large number of fallen angels flew freely, although they seemed to be having fun, but not watching. Azazel turned around, resting one of his hands on the bridge as he gave a half-smile. Welcome to the headquarters of the fallen angels. Welcome to Grigori. He commented with a somewhat proud tone, making the brunette look even more impressed after his words. I must admit that it was quite ingenious to create a barrier to keep humans out. Tiamat declared, stepping through the barrier, looking as if he were going through some kind of violet breeze that suddenly appeared. It's quite a large magic dome, so it's a bit difficult to control. Commented Penemu, beginning to climb the bridge with the others. Or that was before. Since with new technologies, we were able to build devices on top of each tower that gives the dome the necessary magical energy to sustain it. Now, we only have to deposit a part of our magical reserves, unlike before we were forced to take turns to keep the dome stable. Issei moved a little closer to Tiamat, causing the dragon to become slightly serious. She felt that she was somewhat uncomfortable with all the fallen angels passing around her, 
and she was completely understandable why she felt that way. This castle was built during the Great War, as the number of fallen grew exponentially due to the war. Azazel began to tell the story, turning a bit serious. You know, the subject of indiscriminate killing, rape, looting, all the sins you can commit during a war, that very point was what attracted many angels to the dark side. Original sin, the brunette commented, receiving a nod from Azazel. In fact, we had received so many fallen agiles, that we were completely overpopulated. But, the White Dragon Emperor and the Red Dragon Emperor decided to make the headquarters their fighting center, and let's just say it didn't end very well. The casualties were massive. Quote, You've never told me about that. Issei looked at the gauntlet with slight disapproval. As if I'd remember. As far as I'm concerned, the fallen angels were like little ants back then. When you're in the middle of a big fight, never focus on not harming the ants. Diedrag quickly snapped. Defended, although he clearly did not care about the situation. He just didn't want to look so bad in the eyes of the bearer of it. Hum. Issei rubbed the back of his neck, somewhat understanding his partner. Azazel laughed out loud at her comment, before shaking his head. I suppose that makes enough sense. The leader declared, before giving a slight nod in greeting to the guards at the huge steel door, who quickly returned the gesture and began turning some levers outside, slowly opening the door. Gigantic door. Why do they have walls? The brunette asked, knowing that they could easily be penetrated from the air. We asked a human to build it. It would have been weird if we told him we didn't want walls. Azazel replied, waiting for the huge doors to finish opening. And the human. Azazel interrupted Tiamat, knowing what she was going to ask. We killed him and his workers so that this construction would never come to light. I thought so. The dragon replied with slight contempt, although she couldn't say anything about it. After all, she wasn't the best example of morality. But why? The brunette asked, clearly surprised by the statements, and clearly it wasn't a pleasant surprise. I wasn't even in my mind at the time. Azazel clarified, causing Issei to raise an eyebrow. What do you mean by that? The chestnut wondered internally. The doors finally finished opening, being able to see different small places for food, clothing, weapons, and other things in the free places that the castle had left. Noticing the number of fallen in place, Issei practically snuggled into Tiamat. This time, Azazel and Penemu could see his discomfort, although they preferred not to talk about it, for now. Those black wings, the brown-haired man thought, while the image of Rainair and Kokobiel was repeated in his head. All the real enemies he'd had so far. All those who spun the threads from the shadows. They were all fallen angels. He didn't like being judgmental, but he couldn't forget everything that had happened. Especially if he finds himself in a crowd of these entities. His doubts and discomfort were dispelled when the dragon placed a hand on his hair, causing the brown-haired man to look at her with slight confusion. Don't worry. She commented with such a sweet voice, that it shook the brunette's mind completely. I will be by your side, always. Seeing this, Penemu and Azazel could only smile. Apparently they had worried in vain. I'll go see how the rings are found. Penemu approached Azazel, pulling him roughly by the shirt. I guess I don't need to tell you this, but don't let any fall take it away, or the consequences will be dire. He spat out with some poison at the end. Azazel just looked away with a poker face. Can't you leave work even for a minute? Are you in love with homework, or something? She asked herself, causing Penemu to let out a small, hump. From his beautiful lips, at the same time that she looked away and released him. Once left on the ground, Penemu gave Issei a neutral look, then raised and waved her hand without much energy, saying goodbye. This made Issei smile, since she had become much more open to him these past few days, considering that in the first week she didn't even greet him when he left. The three of them stood in front of the castle gates, being greeted by a rather stocky man with short black hair, along with rather intense violet eyes. He only opens his eyes when he sees an irresistible woman, Azazel thought, taking a small sigh. It will be great to see him get a little of his own medicine from him. The three quickly approached the subject, seeing how Azazel extended his hand to greet him with a big smile on his face. Still, he wasn't surprised when she completely ignored him and made a beeline for Issei and Tiamat. Or, to be more specific, he went straight to the dragon. I still don't know who you are, 
but it's a great pleasure to receive you. The subject extended his hand, passing a few centimeters from Issei's face, indirectly telling him to get out of the way. My name is Barakil. I hope to be her guide. When he said his guide, he clearly meant only Tiamat. Diedreg commented in Issei's mind, making the brunette visibly nervous at the situation. Tiamat looked at the subject's hand without any expression. Seconds passed, and a somewhat uncomfortable blizzard passed around him. Seeing that Tiamat did not even shake his hand, Barakil took it in one swift motion, before kissing it respectfully. After this, there were three reactions. Issei widened his eyes like crazy, looking clearly annoyed by what the subject did. Tiamat only raised an eyebrow, as a vein began to form in her hundred. Meanwhile, Azazel only deigned to pat his face, waiting for the party to start. It's more than clear that your original sin is lust, that's why I'll let this act go just this once. Tiamat clarified, rubbing her hand against Barakil's sleeve in disgust. In addition to being beautiful, she is also smart. Barakil exclaimed in slight surprise. In that case, let me show you everything I've learned in these years. I don't think that's the best way to start a conversation, Issei interrupted, getting in front of Tiamat in slight annoyance. He had barely entered Grigori, and there was already a lecherous old man he disliked. Seeing this, Barakil looked at him with a certain grace, as if to prevent what he was about to do. You know something, brat. I'm a cadre, and for that reason I almost always carry out my wishes. She may not look too convinced right now, but I'll make it. So get out. The now presented cadre ordered, holding up his hand. If you don't, I'll just get you out of the way. Azazel knew his partner's attitude very well. Therefore, he knew what he was going to do now. And therefore, he was anxiously awaiting what was about to occur. Barakil moved his hand quickly to get Issei out of the way. It's not like it was a hit or anything like that. It was just that, a push. The problem is that he tried to push the most precious person who had that beautiful woman he was trying to talk to. The shove didn't even reach Issei as the man coughed up a large amount of saliva as he suddenly found himself suspended in mid-air courtesy of Tiamat who was choking him with one hand. Barakil could only cough even more when his neck was tightened by the delicate hand of that beautiful dragon. The icy gaze that pierced his soul didn't allow her to think clearly. He just wanted to get away from such a feared woman as soon as possible. If you lay a finger on him, I'll kill you. Tiamat's cold words made Issei and Azazel shudder, at the same time they were thankful to death that they weren't the receiving end. Barakil could only continue to cough, though somehow he found the strength to nod, making Tiamat let go. The cadre fell to the ground like a sack, coughing non-stop and trying to get back up. How strong! He thought the cadre in complete shock for he had never been subdued so easily with mere brute force. Tiamat knelt in front of him, returning to her neutral gaze. By the way, I'm a virgin, and I recently made the decision to die a virgin for personal reasons. And if I weren't, I would never give myself up to filthy idiots like you. Let all the idiots here know, because I won't have any more the patience I had with you. He stated the dragon in a calm voice, though her words reflected the complete opposite. I understood. The cadre exclaimed between gasps, as he still hadn't caught his breath. I could see it coming. Diedreg commented to no one in particular. Line jump. Penemu landed on one of the eight towers, to then observe a ring the size of a soccer ball and another that was inside it the size of a tennis ball. Both golden rings rotated at a high speed while levitating, shooting a small beam into the sky that was attached to the barrier. Hum. Penemu stopped the largest ring with her hand seeing that the rock embedded in it shone with great intensity. They still have a lot of magic. At least, if they can take care of one thing. Oh, a short guy stepped out of the shadows, having a rather disgusting smile on his face. Did you know it was here? Well, it's not really a mystery, considering that we're talking about you, he commented, studying Penemu's body. As usual, you never seem to take charge of the business department, Tamiel. Penemu looked at him out of the corner of her eye, frowning slightly. The now familiar Tamiel finally stopped his eyes on her breasts, widening his smile a little more. And you are still as hot as ever, my dear Penemu. Stop talking stupid. Remember that patience is not one of my gifts. Penemu declared curtly, spreading her wings to head for the next tower. Always so edge. Why do you deny your true nature so much? 
Why don't you let yourself go? You are just like our leader. Finally, Tamiel nodded with a normal smile. You two will end up dying if you continue to pretend to be angels. Hearing this last part, Penemu stopped instantly, then looked at him out of the corner of her eye. It's true, we are no longer angels, but neither are we idiots who are carried away by their most terrible and mundane desires. The Kadri looked ahead, and then gave her a few last words. As far as I'm concerned, you'll be the ones who will die sooner or later, if you continue with that self-centered attitude. She concluded, then flew away. Tamiel watched her go, then placed a hand on her face with a small smile. And to think that no one could take your body for that stupid human, what a waste. Inside the castle, there's no way, the brown-haired man thought, seeing how the interior of the castle completely broke the scheme of the image he gave from the outside, having elevators and central stairs that led to the second and third floors. On the first floor, under these same stairs, there was a door. In the middle of the stairs, a huge digital banner with a black wing stood tall. Afterwards, a lot of modern furniture and decorations from England were on display, looking like a rather glamorous exhibitionist museum. Even so, it was quite quiet inside, for it was quite a spacious place. Where are the others? Tiamat asked, looking around her surroundings. In their rooms, probably. He answered Barakil, before giving a small sigh. Azazel, why didn't you tell me that this woman was the Dragon Queen? She would have spared me the suffering. Because I know you very well. Azazel answered quickly. When you see a woman of her caliber, you just don't hear a thing. Seriously, you should at least try to control that side of yourself a little. Just a little. He added the fallen, giving a small sigh of annoyance at the end at the attitude of his partner. You know it's impossible to fight my wishes, Barakil replied, giving her a small smile. It's impossible, if you don't try to fight them first. He rebutted Azazel quickly causing Issei and Tiamat to look at him with raised eyebrows. It seems that he is somewhat annoyed. It is curious, since I had understood that it is very difficult to achieve that. Diedreg commented in Issei's mind with great curiosity, receiving a nod from Issei. Oh come on, are you going to start your morality again yet? Barakil asked, crossing his arms. I already learned that it is in vain to argue with you. Azazel declared, with a slightly mocking tone as he opened the door between the stairs of the first floor. Upon opening the door, the guests could see how the small room was surrounded by numerous bookcases, while in the center, there was a large marble table with numerous seats. In them, were some fallen. So, wouldn't you like some action today, Shemhazai? Asked a rather muscular bald man, who was about the size of Barakil. Today I'll have sex with Sahariel. But if he wants, we can have a threesome. She commented to the woman that she had a voluptuous appearance very similar to Rainer's, while she outlined a somewhat dirty smile on her face. I have no problems, Armaros, answered the dwarf of the group, outlining a big smile. I was wondering what you were doing here. Azazel commented to no one in particular, shaking his head. Oh, it's the boss. The only woman in the group commented with a singing tone in her voice. Her gaze fixed for a short second on Issei, licking her lips. This made the brown-haired man shudder, while Tiamat felt her skin goosebumps. The fallen was sucked into enormous discomfort as he felt the dragon's gaze piercing him, so he quickly turned his mundane intentions elsewhere out of sheer instinct. It was a good idea to bring her. Azazel thought, fixing his gaze on Tiamat, outlining a small smile. Well, what brings you here? I'd say it's even weirder to see you in this place, don't you think? Sahariel asked while she kept looking at Tiamat in a somewhat sick way, and he wasn't the only one. First of all, she is Tiamat, the Dragon Queen. This caused everyone to widen their eyes in shock. So, don't try to seduce her, unless you want to take a beating from her. And believe me, it would only be a beating if you're lucky. Azazel declared, sitting up with her ever-smiling smile on her face. The other one is Hyodo Issei. As you may already know, he is Penemu's apprentice. Ah, uh, it must have been hard for you, right honey? The fallen asked, making Issei feel a little uncomfortable again about the name. That woman is always so strict, so serious, it's impressive that you're still alive. Armaros commented with a small smile. Yeah, she's a waste of a woman. If she didn't have such a repulsive character, then she'd be on Gabriel's level. 
Sahariel's comment made Azazel slam her face against the table. That, Tiamat thought, raising an eyebrow. Apparently, Gabriel is a sensitive point for Azazel. Diedreg commented in the chestnut's mind, with great curiosity upon seeing the very unusual reaction of the leader. Back on topic. Azazel cleared his throat, resting his hand on his chin with a small smile. Kyoto will stay here for a day. Please see that the women do not try anything with him, or they will have to face off against Tiamat. Everyone nodded at Azazel's statement. Wait, so this Hyoto Issei guy is the bearer of Diedreg? Barakiel wondered, then gave a small mocking smile. Having such power, how come you couldn't defeat the weakest cadre of all? He asked, making everyone chuckle slightly. I, well, it's just... Issei clenched his fist tightly on his knee, trembling slightly. His tremor dissipated noticeably when he felt Tiamat's warm hand entwined with his. I'm the weaker wielder, I guess. The weakest. That must be pretty tough, right? Barakiel wondered, making Issei even more uncomfortable. A star doesn't generate from one day to the next. Azazel's words made Issei look at him in great surprise. He may be the weakest now, but I'm sure he will achieve great things. Azazel placed a hand on his shoulder, squeezing it slightly. The important thing is not who you are, but what you will do. The only thing I hope is to be able to witness with my own eyes how you achieve greatness. He finished, outlining a big smile. The chestnut felt how his hair stood on end after such words. The only thing he could do is give her a big smile as thanks. After that, Azazel looked at Tiamat, and the dragon greeted him with a small smile as she nodded. Without a doubt, he had earned the respect of both with those words. Hyodo. No, Issei. You don't have to pay attention to what the masses say, just focus on what you want to achieve. And if you need any kind of support, remember that I have full faith in your future achievements. Some applause was heard after Azazel's words, coming from the fallen who were listening to him, while they whistled with great impression at what they heard. Good good. Azazel clapped her hands, resting both hands on his chin. Enough of the sentimentality, it's time to talk about business. Tiamat and Issei left the site, leaving Azazel alone along with the others. Just when the idea of digging around the huge modern castle occurred to them, Penemu appeared in front of them. Now is the time. They were the simple words of the cadre, causing both of them to follow her. After going up the elevator and reaching the top floor, the three stopped in front of a door, where the word, secretary, was engraved. I'll wait out here, Tiamat declared, leaning against the wall as he smoothed his hair back. Penemu and Issei just nodded, walking into the room. The brunette couldn't help but be a little surprised, since it seemed like a pretty normal room, quite simple. In short, pretty boring. The only thing that drew attention in this small room was the large number of swords, spears, katanas, and other melee weapons that were hung on the walls, or neatly placed in special cabinets. Over there are all the katana. She declared the beautiful cadre, pointing to a nearby cabinet. Choose the one you like. Hearing that he could choose anyone, Issei couldn't help but swallow a lot of saliva. The brunette quickly approached the section, seeing and touching one by one all the katanas that were in his range of vision. The designs were fabulous, and there were some that were even taller than Penemu herself. Can I really pick anyone? The chestnut asked, somewhat incredulous at such a gift. Of course, but choose well, because I'll only give you one. She answered the cadre with her usual seriousness, while following her apprentice's every move with her gaze. What do you think, mate? Issei asked, causing Diedreg to clear his throat. Based on the knowledge you gained from recent training, katanas this large would help you in open spaces, but they still have many cons, and all of them are aimed at maneuverability. The only long thing that is profitable is a spear, but you didn't train for it. The dragon explained in a rather technical voice, feeling rather happy that its wielder took him into account in such an important decision. You're right, Issei commented, turning from the large katanas, looking at the smaller ones. Smaller ones are not an option either. Penemu taught me that a katana distributes the weight perfectly, so it would be very wasteful to choose one of that size. Diedreg only nodded internally at the words of his wielder. So, that cuts your chances by a third. The dragon commented, seeing that only four of the twelve katanas remained as a possible choice. Issei ran his hand over the hilt of each one, making little faces. Damn, they all feel great. 
She exclaimed the brunette, ruffling her hair in frustration. Ah all this, Penemu did not take her eyes off him. Although she didn't show it visibly, she was proud that she was able to distinguish which weapon was most appropriate for him. Still, she was expecting something else. Hum. Issei crossed his arms and closed his eyes deeply. Which could it be? What could it be? She thought to herself with great intensity. Without realizing it, he focused so much on his choice that everything around him went black. So it happened. Hey. The brown-haired man opened his eyes abruptly when he saw how a violet flash crossed his eyes, going in a direction to the right. Issei twisted his neck towards the direction almost instantly, seeing how there was a metallic bucket full of old and rusty weapons. Seeing how Issei slowly walked towards the bucket made Penemu's facial expression give hints of change for the first time. The brown-haired man could feel for a short second that violet energy back inside the bucket, so he began to rummage among all the rusty weapons. After getting almost all of them out of the bucket, only one weapon remained. To be more precise, a katana. Issei got up from the ground and stared at her, causing Penemu to raise both eyebrows at what she witnessed. Do you want that one? Its edge is completely deteriorated, as is its hilt. Its steel is also completely rusted, so it does not have to be renewed. Penemu warned her, putting both hands on her hip. Remember that you can only choose one, and there will be no second chance. Hearing this, Issei hesitated for a second, though he finally took it from his hilt. The brown-haired man's eyes shone with decision when he felt that the hilt fit perfectly with his hand, so he didn't hesitate for a second to remove it from the bucket. After that, the three in the room couldn't help but be surprised when Issei raised the sword into the air, as a dense violet-colored substance surrounded the weapon for a second, so that later its edge and hilt could be seen to come together. They had fully recovered. Finally, the brown-haired man supported the steel of the katana in his hand, running his fingers over the rusty surface, so. The touch was not very pleasant. Still, he doesn't care. I definitely want this one. She commented the brunette with a very determined smile on his face. Penemu stared at him for a couple of seconds, already having recovered from the previous surprise, because. The surprise baffled the chestnut, although he managed to find an answer. Well, I couldn't tell you. Issei looked straight into her face with a completely innocent expression. I just felt it calling me. Penemu meditated on the answer for a short second, and then she gave a small smile. I knew it. It was you. Eh yes. It was the only answer that occurred to the chestnut, since he did not understand anything of what was happening. Do you know why someone like me was looking for an apprentice? Penemu's question caused Issei to slightly widen her eyes. Now that she thought about it carefully, she wouldn't have training the inexperienced as a hobby, not even in her dreams. I see that you just realized it. Penemu closed her eyes, still maintaining that cute smile. This was the last mission entrusted to me. Find the wielder of that katana. Penemu approached Issei, placing both hands on her shoulders. Hyodo, that katana you have in your hands, it was created by my father. Not even Didre could go unpunished after hearing such words. WW wait, the brunette exclaimed, completely incredulous. By your father, you mean God. That's how it is. Penemu nodded proudly. By then, the Great War had already faded into the background, and we had finished off the Heavenly Dragons. Besides, Penemu looked down from him with great remorse. I, had managed to get rid of my original sin recently. Issei instantly noticed the pain in his words, but decided that this was not the time to focus on it. Everything was relatively quiet, and the factions were about to make peace. At that time, father appeared in my room and handed me this katana. He told me that I should find an apprentice who could awaken this weapon, and that only a reincarnated demon could use it, the cadre commented, then lowered her gaze with a slight sadness. I never knew why he entrusted me with this mission. The only thing I know is that that time was the last time I saw him. The details so precise, entrusting one last mission just the day before his death. There's no way, Deidre commented, completely shocked. Apparently, you have not lost your wisdom despite the years of being locked away, Red Dragon Emperor. Penemu declared with a small smile. What is happening? The chestnut wondered quite startled, since he was receiving too much information in a very short time. It's something that only I and the highest ranking beings among the three factions know. Since you haven't talked to Michael yet, 
you won't be aware of who God really was, and how important he was, is, and will be. But, I'd rather you see it with your own eyes when the time comes. All right, in that case, Issei broke away from Penemu, swinging the katana wildly. I promise I'll master her perfectly before we say goodbye to her. The last words bounced around Penemu's head, taking her completely by surprise. Before we say goodbye, the words sounded again, causing the cadre to feel a small prick in her heart. Issei looked at her with great surprise when she lowered her head a little sadly, wondering if she had said something she shouldn't. That same day, at night, you never told me it was a katana. Azazel commented, studying the weapon with his gaze. I didn't tell you, because I knew you would want to study it. Answered Penemu, crossing her arms. Azazel just smiled at her statement. You know me very well. Well, you better go to sleep. Penemu said to Issei, causing the brunette to make a little annoyed face. At her, I know you want to try it, but it's too late. I promise I'll show you a couple of techniques tomorrow. She declared the cadre, causing a smile to appear on Issei's face. Finally, Penemu raised her hand and made her typical low-energy greeting, saying goodbye to the brunette, before closing the door of her room. Follow me. I'll guide you to your rooms. Azazel commented, nodding at him. Tiamat and Issei quickly followed him, going down the stairs. What did you think of Grigori? Azazel asked, looking at him sideways. It's quite an interesting place. It's people though, it's a bit, Issei rubbed his hair nervously, as he couldn't find a word that wouldn't offend. Complicated, Azazel answered for the brunette, making him nod energetically. I understand what you mean. But it's not his fault. Being a fallen angel, it's in his nature to behave that way, especially since almost all of the fallen currently alive fell due to the sin of lust. I get it, Issei commented, rubbing his chin. But you two aren't being controlled by those sins are you? Hearing this, Azazel couldn't help but look at him with some interest. That's right, Penemu and I managed to get rid of our original sin, albeit in a very different way. I acquired an ambition much stronger than my own lust, being the investigation of the sacred gears. Even so, to get rid of original sin, it is not enough to just have an ambition more powerful than the sin itself. You also need great willpower. That is why it is considered almost impossible for a fallen angel to manage to control his nature. Azazel stopped in a hallway, looking at him with great interest. But how did you know that we were no longer under that influence? Well, Diedrag had explained a few things to me about original sin, and with their very different attitudes I got the idea that you two were something out of the ordinary among this species. He commented the brunette, rubbing his hair with a smile. I see. Azazel leaned against a door, outlining a small smile. Just so you know, you've been very lucky to have that reference. The two of us are the only ones who have managed to detach ourselves from worldly desires. Not for nothing is almost impossible. After the conversation, Issei had a small memory when Penemu seemed very hurt after remembering how she managed to get rid of her original sin. By the way, how did Penemu get free? The brown-haired question made even Tiamat herself pay special attention to the conversation. Hearing the question, Azazel's face twisted into a very serious one, something almost impossible coming from him. I think that is something that only she can answer for you. I will only tell you that there are worse sins than others, and she fell into the worst of all shortly after the start of the Great War. For you to say that, it must be a very touchy subject. Tiamat commented, receiving a nod from Azazel while the brunette lowered her head, showing great concern for the cadre. Anyway, Azazel exclaimed, opening the door. This will be your room, Issei. It's quite a spacious bed, so I'm sure you'll sleep much better than in the forest. Of that there is no doubt. He exclaimed the brunette, really happy to be able to sleep in something more comfortable than a sleeping bag. Tiamat, your room is in the front. The fallen one commented, making the dragon lower her head a little. Actually. I'd like to sleep next to him, she commented, causing Azazel to look at her with slightly widened eyes. Do they do that all the time? Wait, that's not what you're thinking. Issei waved his hands quickly, making Azazel look at him intently. He really expected an explanation on this. It's not like we're a couple or anything, Tiamat commented, rubbing her arm slightly. Uncomfortably, Issei was always going to be her sore point. 
We only sleep together because we feel good about each other. We feel warm and protected. Tiamat finally raised her face from him, seeing that Azazel had a mischievous smile on his face. This made the dragon look down from her instantly with an imperceptible blush. You can think what you want, but it's the truth. No, it's okay. I believe them. The leader clarified, making Tiamat and Issei a little surprised. It's normal to feel safe next to the person you appreciate the most. He stated, then made a small wave of his hand in farewell. I don't think we'll see each other tomorrow, so good luck. Issei and Tiamat waved back before he closed the door. Azazel stayed glued to the door for a few seconds, arms crossed while a smile did not stop spreading on his face. They just like to sleep together, he whispered to himself, before closing his eyes and starting to leave. You don't even believe that lie yourselves. Tiamat snuggled into Issei's chest, outlining a sweet smile. Because of training, we haven't slept together in a long time. He commented to her, rubbing her face against her chestnut's bare chest. You're right. The days have been a bit hard, although I'm starting to get used to it now. Issei answered, surrounding Tiamat's waist with one of her hands, enclosing her in a strong hug. Feeling the warm embrace, Tiamat returned the gesture and pressed even closer to the chestnut's body, positioning her face in the center of his chest with a pleased smile on her face. Good night, the dragon wished her, closing her eyes with great happiness. Good night, Issei waved back, positioning his chin on Tiamat's hair, as he caressed her back. Line jump. It's time to go. Penemu burst into the room, then her eyes widened slightly when she saw how Tiamat sat on top of the brunette's waist, while he rubbed his eyes. You don't need to be so loud, she declared with a bit of a bad mood, as she smoothed her long, silky light blue hair. Perfect, she exclaimed the brown-haired man with a big smile, sitting up suddenly and taking Tiamat just above her behind, causing the dragon to give a small moan of surprise, while her cheeks blushed slightly from the contact and the closeness so close. Sudden. Luckily for her, Issei was too focused on Penemu's words to notice. It's time to use that katana. Issei clenched his fists tightly, looking at the weapon. Penemu only deigned to look away with a small blush. She may be quite a stoic woman, but it's hard not to feel a little uncomfortable when you see two people who are somewhat close to you, riding on top of each other, on the same bed, wearing nothing but their underwear. She couldn't be blamed, anyone would think of something dirty in those moments. Several hours later. Nothing better than a good bath after training. Penemu thought, taking off completely a transparent dress she was wearing, leaving only a small black panty, and her iconic white bandages tight on her breasts. Just as she stepped into the stream, she watched as Tiamat emerged from the water, close to her. The dragon was completely naked, being helped by her hair and water, which were responsible for covering the most intimate parts of her. I didn't know you bathed here. Penemu commented, looking at her sideways. I have to stay close, just in case. She answered the dragon simply, leaning on a rock that jutted out of the stream. Are you still suspicious? Penemu asked, crossing her arms and closing her eyes. Hearing this, Tiamat lowered her head slightly, thinking about his words. Finally, seconds passed without either of them saying another word to each other. The atmosphere wasn't friendly, but it wasn't tense either. They were just there. Now that, I look at you more closely, how do you do it? Tiamat decided to break the silence with a question, causing Penemu to look at her with a raised eyebrow. What do you mean? You know, isn't it very uncomfortable for your nipples to wear such tight bandages? Penemu looked at Tiamat with slightly widened eyes at his question, for he clearly had not expected such a question. Especially, coming from someone like Tiamat. Well, the truth is that when they started to grow non-stop, that's where I started to use you. Penemu looked at her breasts, then lightly touched them. At first it was very annoying, but as time went by, my breasts continued to grow, and my nipples ended up digging into them. For that reason, they don't show through the fabric. Penemu cleared up his suspicions, making the dragon approach her with great curiosity. I see, do you ever date again? She asked herself with great interest. After that question, a small blush appeared on Penemu's face. Only when I get too hot. Wow, was the dragon's simple response, then looked firmly at her breasts. But why did you want to bandage them? I mean, I don't think it bothered you that much going brawless. Besides, 
They don't look that big. Hearing this, Penemu just smiled. My fighting style is based on very fast and precise movements, he began to explain, slowly entangling his bandages. Being a kunoichi, having such large breasts hinders my movements, she continued, firmly grasping the end of the blindfold. That's why I squeeze them to such a degree that they look like half their size. She concluded herself, completely removing the bandages from her. Tiamat's eyes widened as Penemu's breasts bounced freely, falling below her navel. The two mounds of her possessed an overwhelming firmness despite her size, and that was what impressed the dragon the most. Each of her breasts looked like a circular pillow that was about to explode from the large amount of cotton they had inside. That made that, even from behind her, the two mounds of her are distinguishable without much difficulty. Did I already say they were too big? I never wanted to have them this big, but it just happened. She cleared the cadre, sitting down in the water with a small smile. Tiamat sat next to him, looking at the sky with a stupor still on her skin. If we combine the firmness and its volume, I think you have the best breasts in the world. Hearing this, Penemu could only laugh. Says the woman with the most coveted ass by all. Hey! The dragon exclaimed, then laughed with her. These girl talks are pretty weird. I can't deny they're fun, though. Penemu commented, closing her eyes with satisfaction. After hearing her words, Tiamat watched her carefully for a few seconds. You know what? I think I'll go. Hey. Penemu looked at her with great surprise after her words. Tiamat looked up at the sky with a small smile on her face. In these two weeks, I have realized that I can trust you. In fact, I have quite enjoyed the two talks we have had. I have also talked a lot with Tannen, and she told me that you are a great woman. I do not have to continue having that distrust with you. Tiamat fixed his gaze on Penemu, giving him a smile as he raised her hand. I'll give you a chance, and I'll believe in you. Penemu stared at the hand for a brief second, then looked at her again. That means a lot, coming from the Dragon Queen. The Kadri shook hands with her and Tiamat, causing them both to give each other a cute smile. Of course, I will come to visit Issei very often. Tiamat stated with some seriousness. I know. You two are very close. In fact, you take care of him too much, commented Penemu with a small mischievous smile, making Tiamat a little nervous. Again, they had touched her. Sore spot. So much notice. More than a question, it was a simple whisper on Tiamat's part. Of course, although he doesn't seem to notice. Penemu commented with some mischief. He is, very innocent. She declared with great nervousness, lowering her head slightly with a deep blush on her face. I never imagined that I would see her this way, Penemu thought with quite a bit of surprise. He must definitely love Hyoto very much. More than I can imagine. We can change the subject. Penemu was visibly surprised when he noticed how Tiamat's gaze was quite downcast. At that moment, it was when she realized that it was not a simple nervousness of love. Something much deeper was going on behind her, and it didn't look very pleasant. Even so, out of respect for her new friend's privacy, she decided to put it aside as quickly as possible, and continue with a casual chat. The next day, Issei was looking at the top of the mountain where Tiamat usually watched him, seeing that now only Tannen was in that place. Do you miss her already? Penemu asked, drawing her katana from her sheath. It's not that, he commented on the chestnut, and then looked at her with a smile. Actually, I wanted to thank you. Hearing this, Penemu couldn't help but look at him with some interest. She's had a huge trust issue because of everything she's been through. For her to walk away calmly indicates that she's starting to trust people a little more again. He explained the brunette, then pointed his katana at Penemu. It's something that makes me very happy. Lakadri stayed thinking for a short second about Issei's words, instantly thinking that her trust problem would have to do with something from her past and most likely that something is what has marked her forever, and for that reason it is that he does not want to confess to the chestnut. Still, those were personal issues, and since she didn't count hers, she wasn't going to force anyone to. In fact, she would feel very bad if she did. Going back to the main topic, I'd like to show you some new skills. Penemu commented, and then put on a very serious look. Pay attention. The grip on his weapon intensified noticeably, at the same time that the sword was imbued with electricity. Right after, a few words fell from his lips. Dance of the Eleven Bloody Grips. He exclaimed, 
making eleven thrusts shoot forward with a speed almost imperceptible to the chestnut. They were so fast that the residual ray trails marked eleven different points. Seeing this, Issei looked at her in slight surprise. Now that I think back, that attack was done to me in our friendly match. You remembered. Penemu nodded, then looked at him seriously. This attack is not eleven baseless thrusts. Each attack is designated to a specific vital area found in the torso of any person. The first two to the lungs, the third to the liver, the fourth to the stomach, the fifth to the pancreas, the sixth and seventh to the kidneys, the eighth to the large intestine, the ninth to the small intestine, the tenth to the bladder, and the eleventh to the heart. The rays introduced through the wound are responsible for burning and destroying the organs, causing instant death. Hearing this, Issei's face turned white. Are you saying that if she hadn't dodged that attack, I? Of course not. Penemu clarified instantly. My goal was not to kill you, so I diverted the trajectory of the attacks to a place where you would not have been in as much danger, although to be honest, I did not expect you to dodge them, Lakadri cleared her throat. Anyway, even though it looks like an amazing attack, it's kind of useless. It only works if you have absolute precision, and you know what position these organs are in. Also, you must also make sure that your opponent can't dodge them, because otherwise they will be in vain. Penemu shook the katana, removing the few particles of electricity that were still around. In short, it's an attack I created to mass kill people who are weaker than me, and it's only for that purpose. What I'm getting at with this is that you should create a technique. Very good. The Kadri nodded. First you must master the stance perfectly. When you have just achieved that, is where you can start thinking about your techniques. Wait. I don't even have an elemental affinity. How am I supposed to create techniques? The chestnut asked with great curiosity. You don't need an elemental affinity to create techniques. The only thing that helps you is in the variety that you could use. Seeing that Issei was slightly distracted, Penemu gave a small sigh. But like I said, focus on mastering your posture first, Hyodo. Oh yeah. He quickly answered the brunette, entering a combat stance again. Line jump. The reconstruction of the academy is going as expected. Apparently. Classes will start in a month. Tiamat thought, entering the Hyodo home. The place was completely dark, so he turned on the light. I'm here, he commented, then stretched as he went to the second floor. There's no one waiting for me, anyway, she said to herself, as she gave a somewhat adorable little yawn. He was beginning to think that the underdeveloped lizard had been rubbing off on him in some way. Luckily Issei's parents are away. I wouldn't like to explain my sudden visit. Tiamat rubbed her hair sleepily, then took the doorknob of his room. Just as she was about to open it, she directed her gaze to Issei's room, and the cute memories began to flood her mind. His hand wavered for a second, and he finally gave in to temptation. Tiamat clasped her two hands together as a blush spread over her face. I guess he won't mind if I sleep in his bedroom. Meanwhile, in a faraway place it's time to take a bath. Penemu declared, sheathing her katana. Hum. Are we done yet? The brunette wondered with slight surprise, since he didn't feel the least bit exhausted. That's how it is. Penemu agreed. Take a bath before lunch. I couldn't stand having you around with a bad smell. Yeah. He answered Issei in a soldier's pose, to then see how Penemu left the site. How strange. The brunette thought. She doesn't sweat a drop in training. This made Issei have a big question in his head. How strong is he really? Line jump. How are you feeling, partner? Diedrag's question brought a smile to Issei's face. I feel great. She answered the brunette, doing some stretching on his shoulder. It's the only time of the day that I can remove my armor without having some kind of repercussion, huh? The brunette blinked in slight surprise after realizing something very interesting. Until you realized it, brat. Diedrag commented with some grace, so that then Issei could see his whole body and rub his hundred hard. I don't feel any kind of tiredness from wearing the armor for so many hours, Issei raised his fist, then clenched it tightly. The results are coming sooner than I thought. We've only been here a little over two weeks. Remember that the fall mentioned a second training, so don't get too happy. The dragon declared with a certain seriousness, then smiled. Still, good job. Hearing the last words, Issei could only smile. Thanks my friend. The talk was completely interrupted when Issei went through a tree, since he saw something that almost made his eyes shoot out. 
The brown-haired man jumped to the nearest bush and stuck his head out, denoting how the veins in his eyes were very marked at what he was witnessing. The sun hit Penemu all over her body, while her flushed face was carried away with slight moans of pleasure. Her sheer robe still encircled her body, but she was ajar letting both hands go in the direction of her breasts as she slowly caressed them with great enthusiasm. She was kneeling on the edge of the stream, letting all that wave of pleasure escape through her subtle and extremely pleasant touches, letting herself be carried away by the beautiful sensation that took off from her chest, and traveled around her entire body in a circuit circular that seemed to have no end. Her completely soaked and sticky black panties could not contain so much fluid, making the sand wet. Is she, touching herself? Issei quickly shook his head from her, to make sure that what she was seeing was real. It's normal, mate. It's in her nature. It's something she needs to do with some regularity in order to continue to control herself. Diedreg commented with a bit of grace, seeing his bearer's reaction. I understand. She answered the brown-haired one, to then outline a small smile and look away from her. I still have to fulfill that promise, so I won't let this situation make me falter. Diedre nodded with great satisfaction, seeing that Issei still remembered the promise he made when she died that time. Besides, I think it would be disrespectful to her. I mean, I don't think she'd like being forced to do that sort of thing. He commented the brunette, turning to leave. For his character, he does look, mate. Diedre commented. Issei rested one of his hands on a tree, before stopping in his thoughts. Tiamat's flushed. Sweaty face flashed through her mind for a second. I wonder, what would Tiamat look like in this situation? Did you imagine Tiamat touching herself? Diedre asked with a clear mocking tone. Hearing this, Issei continued walking as if nothing had happened. I wouldn't be able to imagine something like that. Of course I do. Don't play the saint with me. The dragon commented with great grace. I already told you no. Yes, you did it. I did not do it. Yes, you did it. I did not do it. Yes, you did it. I did not do it. Quote ellipsis quote. 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 Yes, you did it. Shut up. Ellipsis. Issei. Tiamat's moan was heard throughout the house. The dragon poked her face between the chestnut sheets, her face was completely flushed and sweaty. Her erratic breathing made her chest rise and fall with great intensity, while she hugged Issei's pillow tightly, putting it on her nose. Her legs were entwined on the pillow as she rubbed her body with great intensity against it. His entire body had a thin sheen of sweat, giving him a look that would take anyone's breath away. She was unbelievably beautiful, and at the same time, she was sexy as hell. I love you so much, he commented between gasps. I'm going crazy. The lower part of her body jerked even more as she tightened her grip on the pillow even more, letting herself be carried away by the immense waves of pleasure that hit the forbidden zone of her body from the simple touch. Her eyes glazed over with pleasure as she let her mind flood with her deepest desires. Ah, hum, Issei. Don't stop. She moaned with great emotion, causing the bed to start shaking violently giving the impression that she was about to break. In those moments, Tiamat kissed the pillow tightly when she felt something incredible approaching, making her gaze flood with pleasure like never before. Her back twisted strangely at the overwhelming sensation, and still it wasn't enough to stop her. She finished kissing her with her pillow and hugged her even tighter, as she gasped and positioned her face on top of it. Even so, although she seems very happy, his eyes, his beautiful light blue eyes reflected an absolute loneliness. She didn't want to fantasize about Issei, she wanted all of this to be real. She wanted him to caress every inch of her body. She wanted him to whisper beautiful things in her ear. She wanted him to kiss her. She, she only wanted to become one with her beloved. End of chapter.